On Capitol Hill today, members of a House National Security Subcommittee met to examine methods for detecting anthrax in public places. You'll hear speakers from groups including the Centers for Disease Control, the Army Medical Research Institute, and the U.S. Postal Service. Congressman Chris Shays chaired the four-hour hearing. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled Stamping Out Anthrax in Postal Facilities, the Technologies and Protocols for Bioagent Detection is called to order. When the male-borne anthrax attacks of 2001 were of domestic or foreign origin remains a mystery. The investigation to date has not discovered who forever transformed one innocent letters and packages into ubiquitous vectors of disease. So the lessons learned from these tragic events remain our best defense against further attempts to contaminate the male stream and other public spaces with deadly spores. There was much to learn. Once it became clear the envelopes sent to Senator Leahy and Daschle had left a deadly trail of extraordinary virulent, statistically volatile anthrax, established as assumptions, established assumptions about the ancient pathogen has to be discarded. The accepted lethal dose of eight to 10,000 airborne germs derived mainly from animal data had to be revised drastically downward perhaps to just a single spore. Sampling and testing protocols proved insensitive to finely engineered material easily re aerosized It is those sampling and testing protocols we examine today. The search for anthrax at the Wallingford, Connecticut Postal Facility offers an instructive case study, a cautionary tale on the need to maintain a more aggressive approach to novel health hazards in the workplace. Last month, the General Accounting Office released a report critical of Postal Service communications to employees during the anthrax crisis. Confusing communications stemmed in part from what has been generously characterized as an evolving system of environmental sampling. In truth, it only evolved from a complacent almost symbolic program to disprove the presence of anthrax to an aggressively, to an appropriately aggressively effort to find spores because Miss Otilly Lundgren died. Obviously, several negative factors at Wallingford proved no reliable evidence the facility was free of potentially dead, dead, deadly anthrax. Jurisdictional jealousies, false economies, and some scientific hubris artificially limited the quantity and quality of sampling and testing. Facing a wholly new situation, understandable errors were made, but too often and for too long, those mistakes were not made on the side of excess caution, but in the service of unwarranted conclusions about the safety of contaminated facilities. When a finding of negative, does not mean zero, and just a few spores can be as deadly as a million, sampling must be widespread and aggressive. Testing must yield sufficiently detailed information to allow health officials and the public to make sound decisions about the prophylactic treatments and site decontamination. De 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 Despite the hard-learned lessons of Brentwood, the Hart Building in Wallyford, standardized sampling and testing protocols are not yet complete. It seems likely a new anthrax outbreak by mail would trigger another confusing cascade of interagency committees and inconsistent testing regimes. Until uniform, scientifically validated protocols are in place, we all stand as sentinels like Otilly Lundgren human detectors waiting for our immune systems to sound the alarm. 
Our witnesses today will describe current anthrax sampling and laboratory testing technologies and efforts to apply those technologies more consistently and forcefully in the future. We appreciate their time and expertise, and we look forward to their testimony. Governor, do you have any statement you'd like to make? Sure. Okay. Now, seeing our panel, we have Dr. Keith Rhodes, Chief Technologist, General Accounting Office, accompanied by Mr. Bernie Unger, and Mr. Jack Melling is here as well. Uh, Mr. Robert, a second testimony from Dr. Robert G. Ha Hamilton, Director John Hopkins. Uh, and uh, we have accompanying him Mr. Barry S uh, Slotnick. A testimony, Colonel Eric A. Henschel, Commander U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, accompanied by Mr. Uh, Dr. George Lundwick. Gentlemen, if you would stand, we'll swear you in. Uh, anyone else who might be uh, giving testimony, if you'd stand and raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. No, for the record, affirmative. I may have confused our second panelist. I apologize. And we'll do some UCs asking unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. Ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to, to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. And also um, ask unanimous consent that um, my colleague from Connecticut, uh, Rosa Delora, be allowed to participate as a member of the committee without objection so ordered. Do you have a statement you might like to make? If you do, you can. Did you, do you want to? Yes. Yeah. If you have a statement, you. If I can, I would. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very, very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate your accommodation of uh, my being here to, uh, to uh, listen to the testimony today. Um, as a fellow member of the Connecticut delegation, I know we share the same concerns with regard to safeguarding our postal system so that the American people and our postal workers are never again really put at risk by biological attacks like the anthrax attacks that claimed the lives of five people, including Connecticut resident uh, Adelie Lundgren. Uh, today's hearing is an important opportunity learning for what happened in the fall of 2001 during the anthrax attacks on our postal system, in particular at the Southern Connecticut Processing and Distribution Center in Wallingford, Connecticut, which is in my district and which I have visited several times uh, since the attacks. Uh, today, we will examine our response to that crisis, in particular what went right, what went wrong, and what we can do better if there is ever a next time. Um, in retrospect, I think we were very lucky that no Connecticut postal workers died during the attacks that contaminated mail that passed through the Wallingford facility because there were several communication breakdowns, and that concerns me greatly. Uh, as others have noted, the Postal Service conducted two tests on the Wallingford facility following the tragic death of Ms. Lundgren to investigate whether that facility had any traces of anthrax. The results of those tests, using dry and wet swabs and taken on November 11th and 21st, 2001, respectively, were negative. Tests conducted by the Center for Disease Control on November 25th were also negative. But as postal workers continued to work at the Wallingford facility, a more comprehensive test was conducted by the CDC three days after the initial CDC test using wet wipes and the HEPA vacuums, and those tests came back positive. Further tests taken by the CDC and the Postal Service confirmed those positive results. Three million anthrax spores were found on mail sorting machines. So my first concern is why did it take so long to, the te to detect the contamination, and why wasn't more comprehensive testing done following Ms. Lundgren's death? Especially given that postal workers continue to work at the facility, one would think that using all the resources available would be an urgent priority. Uh, my other concern relates to the Postal Service's seeming reticence to make public those later test results that showed that its workers, in fact, were at risk. While I understand that the Postal Service has said that it was following its guidelines, which say the results must first be validated before being made public, why then, then did the service show no such reticence in releasing the negative and, as it turned out, false results of the earlier tests. There's an inconsistency here that I find troubling. When we are dealing with matters of public health, 
I think the public is better served when we err on the side of caution, when we are more, not less, forthcoming and straightforward with releasing such information. We simply cannot afford to take chances with people's lives, particularly given the truly heroic efforts of those postal workers at Wallingford. They soldiered on in the face of an unseen and a deadly threat. 1,100 employees at the Wallingford Postal Facility deserved to have full understanding of the facts so that they could make an informed decision before going to work every day. I commend my colleague from Connecticut, Chairman Shays, for convening this hearing today. I hope that we can correct the problems that slowed or hindered our response and continue to foster those things that went right. All of us want the same thing for the American public to be safe and to be protected. As a member of the Labor, Health, and Human Services Appropriations Subcommittee, which oversees funding for CDC, I am also looking forward to hearing from the CDC and, and from Connecticut's Department of Public Health about how they work together to stem this outbreak in Connecticut. Griffin Hospital in nearby Derby very quickly identified the case of anthrax and isolated the outbreak. Again, we are fortunate that we had only one death. With that, I thank the chairman and the committee for allowing me to participate today um, and hope that we can make a real difference in the fight against biological terrorist attacks. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady, and we're grateful to have you here. And Mr. Ruppersberger, uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, while the focus on, <coughs> on today's hearing is on the Wallingford, Connecticut incident and the June 2nd rollout of detection test sites across the country, uh, I have particular interest in this, to this topic. I represent the Baltimore area. Uh, the Baltimore Distribution Center has been the first and only pilot test site to date. <clears throat> Baltimore has been running the Bioagent Detection System, that's BDS, since June 2002. Using state-of-the-art technology, there have been no positives since the pilot program began, and their success has allowed for the rollout to remain on schedule. My understanding of the issue goes beyond the Baltimore facility. The pilot system has been built by Northrop Grumman, a Smith's detection, uh, which are both in my, my district, which is also, and I have, I have visited those fact, those uh, manufacturing areas and been briefed on that. And they are building systems now for 14 test sites throughout the country. Uh, the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Army Engineers, and John Hopkins have all played vital ro roles in this technology. We have learned so much in the last year and a half about bioterrorism and how to apply technological advances to new line front defense workers like the Postal Service. And I look forward to the testimony today and learning more about where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just looking at the um, uh, fact that we don't have enough chairs for folks. I'm uh, interested in maybe having the second panelist, if you don't mind, uh, use the first three chairs on either side, and that'll free up some chairs. So if some of the second panelists could just sit up, up front here, we'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. That frees up a few chairs. Someone wants to grab them. Okay. Uh, we're going to um, hear first from uh, Dr. Rhodes and uh, then Dr. Hamilton and then uh, Colonel Henschel. Um, I, well, the way we do it is we do the five minute rule and we roll over the clock, but I would just assume you not take the full second five minutes. If, if you could, you know, stop a minute or two or three a, a, into your second round, that would be helpful. So you might have to summarize. And obviously, um, did I do the UCs? Yes, you did. Okay, so we're all set. Dr. Rhodes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I am Keith Rhodes, uh, GAO's chief technologist and the director of GAO's Center for Technology. I'm going to ask you to talk into the silver, the silver mic. mic. Okay. Uh, yeah. You need, right. Yeah. Let's okay. see if we can hear you better. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. I am Keith Rhodes. JAO's Chief Technologist and the Director of JAO's Center for Technology and Engineering. I am accompanied by Bernie Unger, Director for Postal Issues in the Physical Infrastructure Team, and Dr. Jack Melling, former head of the UK's Center for Applied Microbiology and Research. We are pleased to be here today to present our findings on anthrax testing conducted by the Postal Service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the Southern Connecticut Processing and Distribution Center in Wallingford, Connecticut. As you know, in September and October 2001, four letters containing Bacillus anthracis spores were mailed to news media personnel and congressional officials. As a result, 
The letters contaminated numerous postal facilities and exposed several postal workers to anthrax. Some of the workers became sick with two dying of inhalation anthrax. Three other people also died from inhalation anthrax, including an elderly woman in Connecticut, a postal customer. After contamination was found in the Wallingford facility, a union official raised concerns regarding how postal managers communicated test results to workers. We have issued a report in this regard, the recommendations of which are included in this testimony. Even though our analysis of the Wallingford incident is only one part of the larger study we are doing for you, it gives unique insight into the lessons that need to be learned from the response of the federal government, state health departments, and the Postal Service to the anthrax attacks. The Wallingford facility was unique in that it did not directly handle the anthrax letters. Rather, it was cross-contaminated by them, with the largest number of spores being found in a sample collected from a single machine. There was, however, evidence that the spores had become airborne, since small numbers of spores were found in elevated areas more than 20 feet above the contaminated machine. In addition, while other facilities had workers and customers who suffered from either cutaneous or inhalation anthrax, the death of a postal customer served by the Wallingford facility underlines the insidious nature of anthrax and the difficulty in determining a lethal dose. Since the elderly Connecticut woman died from anthrax when no evidence of anthrax could be found in either her home or places she frequented. To compound this, a single spore was found on a letter received by another postal customer in the community, and yet no other illnesses or deaths in the community were reported. Further, the Wallingford facility was outside the predictive analysis that the Postal Service performed to determine the impact on the rest of the postal distribution network of the contaminated letters processed through facilities in Washington, D.C. and Trenton, New Jersey. The unpredictability of both the lethality of anthrax and the route that contaminated mail might take makes it extremely difficult to establish the health risks associated with a release of a biological agent, such as anthrax, inside a facility that serves the public. This difficulty underscores the need for a standardized and aggressive response, as well as forward planning, to protect facility workers and the public should an anthrax attack occur again. As you know, determining whether or not a facility is contaminated with anthrax is critical. This is dependent upon, one, the methods used for sampling, two, the locations from which samples were collected, and three, how many samples were collected. The Postal Service's testing of the Wallingford facility originally used the dry swab method for sample collection and found no anthrax. After the death of the elderly Connecticut woman on November 21, 2001, the CDC and the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry used targeted sampling, focusing on the mail sorting machines and different sampling methods, wet wipes and HEPA vacuums. They also collected more than three times the number of samples previously collected by the Postal Service and found contamination in some of the samples. This inability to initially find anthrax contamination shows that neither qualitative that is positive or negative, nor quantitative test results from a qualified laboratory can be used to establish a health risk. Positive results only show whether contamination is present in the samples collected. However, negative results do not necessarily mean that a facility is free from contamination. Quantitative test results only show the extent of contamination in the specific samples found to be positive, not how much anthrax is present in the facility. For example, 3 million anthrax spores were found on one machine in Wallingford. However, with regard to the health risk to an individual, although this number was significantly higher than what was considered historically to be a lethal dose for an individual, 8,000 to 10,000 spores, CDC did not know how to extrapolate the amount in a sample to a person's risk for inhalation anthrax. The Environmental Protection Agency recently reported that in order to perform credible risk assessments, it is essential to identify the minimum number of spores needed to cause inhalation and cutaneous anthrax. Nevertheless, there is now a consensus among the experts that a few spores could be harmful to a susceptible individual 
as may have been the case in the death of the Connecticut woman. Public health response is most effective and efficient when it is proactive, when it focuses on prevention rather than on consequence management. Thus, the Wallingford incident illustrates the challenges facing the federal government, the state health departments, the network of diagnostic laboratories, and those companies that serve the general public, including the Postal Service. The challenge can be summed up in one question, is it safe? This is what everyone asked during the fall of 2001, and this is what everyone is trying to answer to this day. Unfortunately, the best answer anyone can give is, it is probably safe. Once a building has been contaminated, one can never say there is no risk, but there can be a low risk. What all those who are trying to protect the public health must realize is that they are defining the risk level for others. In this case, the postal workers as well as the general public. The impact of additional anthrax cases could result in illness or loss of life as well as loss of confidence in the nation's postal system. Further, even though the health risk is probably low, it is uncertain. We are therefore recommending that the Postmaster General, in consultation with CDC, EPA, OSHA, as well as any other relevant agencies and postal unions, for those facilities that were deemed free of anthrax spores based solely on a single negative sampling result, that they, one, reassess the risk level for postal workers at those facilities and the general public served by those facilities, two, reconsider the advisability of retesting those facilities, employing the most effective sampling methods and procedures, and three, communicate to the postal workers and the general public the results of the reassessment of health risk, the advisability of retesting, the rationale for these decisions, and other relevant information that may be helpful regarding the health of the postal workers and the general public. Mr. Chairman, this concludes our statement. My colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions you or members of the subcommittee have. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Dr. Hamilton. <clears throat> You're going to want to lower that mic, hmm. and it's the silver one that amplifies your voice. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity and for members of the subcommittee. My name is Robert Hamilton, and I am a professor of medicine and pathology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I also direct the diagnostic, uh, the DACI Reference Laboratory, which is an allergy and immunology laboratory at Johns Hopkins. I'm speaking to you today as an academic scientist, an individual who was not directly involved in the anthrax events. However, my group became uh, pulled into this, uh, this issue when, in fact, this simple collecting device was, in fact, used in the Brentwood and the Wallingford facilities to collect surface dust. And we, we developed this and applied this collector about 10 years ago to the sampling of indoor environments for homes of children with asthma and allergies for assessing indoor air allergens. So the question about the applicability of this to indoor anthrax assessment was of great interest to us. I'd like to start out by introducing the concept of the environmental surface testing system a system in which a sample is collected from a surface and then it's transported into the laboratory where it is extracted from the specimen, it's analyzed by one of a variety of assays, and then its re results are reported. Now in each one of these four components, I think that we can do better at, at improving the methodologies that were used. And I'll try and give you some illustrations as I go through this presentation. Let's focus on the first issue of um, how sensitive were the methods that were available. It's our opinion, and I've present my con concepts, and in, in collab I collaborated with uh, Barry Skolnick, who has actually developed a show and tell of these methodologies, if in fact you wish to see them later. It's our contention that in fact we really can't answer the question of how sensitive these methods are, because we have really never had positive controls, samples that tell us that, in fact, the methodology is either valid and have helped us in assessing the reproduci re reproducibility of these methods. So I don't think, at this point, based on the data that's in the literature, that we can actually answer the question of how sensitive these methods really are. We do have some experience from NASA 
using some of their uh, surface wipe testing procedures of spacecraft that give us some feeling for what technology pushed to its limit can do. But as to the methods that were actually used, I'm not sure we can answer that question. Now, as to the second component of your questions, which were how appropriate were the protocols and how, what can we learn from Wallingford, I have three areas that brings me into three areas of recommendations that I'd like to leave with the committee. And those can be summarized in three, in, in essentially four words. The first is leadership, the second is support, and the third is peer review. Now, in terms of leadership, we need a single federal agency to take responsibility for overseeing the characterization, the improvement, and the validation of the diagnostic, the surface collection testing methods that we have available. And I'm focusing on surface because I think in the government we've focused very well on optimizing airborne sampling. But it wasn't the airborne samples at these facilities that gave us the real information. It was the surface specimens that allowed us to make these decisions. And as an illustration, we probably wouldn't have used dry swabs in the postal facility with, based on the protocol used in the US, by the U.S. postal system if, in fact, we really had a leadership organization that was saying, well, the CDC recommends wet swabs, why? And, well, let's get together and develop a consensus. And they would have found out that wet swabs were, were, were improved, and they probably wouldn't have used dry swabs. So that was an issue of leadership, in my opinion. A second issue could be focused on what units were used to report the results. Results were reported in colony forming units per gram. Now, in allergy testing, that makes all the sense because that's the way that we report results. But in terms of assessing loading or burden within the environment within a particular instrument or piece of equipment, colony forming units per area or per total burden is more relevant. So the way that the results were reported would have probably been different if we had a leadership, a, an agency that oversaw the consensus building of a, of a protocol. The second point I'd like to uh, focus on is support. Now, in pre preparing a couple of research grants and submitting them to a variety of agencies, we have been able to identify no obvious extramural support mechanism for individuals who are outside government, such as academics and industrial scientists who have ideas that can help improve the methodologies, to actually find funding for, uh, for our ideas. And so I'd like to suggest that we need improved focus on support, both financial and resources, to focus on this issue of developing a consensus guideline that ultimately allows us to have validated methods. And the third area is peer review. I, coming from an academic environment, I feel that an open discussion of issues is extremely important to getting good ideas out and I realize there's a national security issue here with some proprietary concepts that can't be discussed in public. But by opening up peer review, we probably would have learned more about the existing methodologies that NASA's already created that have shown us the way to possibly improving the, the, the wipe-rinse assay that, in fact, the CDC ultimately used to, to um, identify spores in the Wallingford facility. So, Again, to emphasize, I believe we need a single agency that will help us in developing and bringing all of the governmental scientists, and we have great technical capability in our government, together. And along with support from the academic community, of which we're one of many individuals who have ideas on how to improve methods, and industrial concerns that in fact have technologies that could be applied, I feel that, and with the support, the financial and the resource support, and with open peer review where we can discuss and develop these ideas and develop a consensus, that we can actually develop methods with very little additional effort, which in fact will allow us to adequately deal with any potential threat from the future with regard to anthrax. With that, I'd like to close my remarks and uh, and thank you for the opportunity, and I'm open to questions if you wish. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Uh, Colonel? Mr. Chairman and distinguished committee members, I'm honored to appear before your committee to answer your questions regarding technologies and protocols for detecting anthrax and other biological agents. 
I am Colonel Eric Henschel, the commander of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, known as USAMRD. USAMRD has had a 34-year history of basic and applied research in the area of diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of hazardous infectious diseases. Our efforts, especially over the past eight years, have been instrumental in the development of reagents and the evaluation of medical diagnostic systems and procedures that are playing an active role in our nation's defense and national security. During the 2001 anthrax attacks, I led a team that processed over 30,000 environmental samples and performed approximately 260,000 assays supporting the Senate, the Capitol Police, the FBI, the CDC, and other executive branch agencies. Dr. George Ludwig, who is USAMR's Chief Diagnostic Systems Division and coordinates basic and applied research of medical diagnostic technologies for the Department of Defense, joins me today. The tragic events following the terrorist use of the U.S. Postal Service during the fall of 2001 to deliver anthrax spores demonstrates that there is still much to be learned about the effects of this agent under conditions different from those encountered during natural outbreaks. In particular, the health effects of aerosolized anthrax spores in various populations are poorly understood. The death of a possibly immunocompromised 94-year-old woman in Oxford, Connecticut from inhalation anthrax after no known exposure suggests that some populations may be much more susceptible than others. The fact that relatively few cases of anthrax were observed among the large number of individuals potentially exposed to high concentrations of anthrax spores further complicates interpretation of the epidemiological data. Estimates for infectious or lethal doses of anthrax spores are based upon studies with animal, laboratory animals, not humans, and the values must be interpreted very carefully. The most common figures quoted for lethal aerosol doses of anthrax are between 8,000 and 50,000 spores. This range reflects the dose estimated to be capable of killing one half of the animals exposed. There is substantial scientific uncertainty regarding the dose response relationship, and there's no scientific consensus has been reached on the lethal infectious dose in humans. As a result, we are concerned that any level of contamination of the anthrax could potentially lead to harm to some exposed individuals. While any amount of contamination should be a concern, the context of that contamination must be carefully considered, especially when attempting to determine a forensic link to a purposeful release and when attempting to formulate health policy. The detection of spores and dust collected from an urban U.S. Postal F Service facility would be of greater concern than finding spores in soil collected in a rural area. These differences illustrate the need to make use of all available expertise when making policy decisions from basic test data. At USAMRD, we err on the side of caution initially, but use all available resources to formulate a long-term response that is appropriate for the situation. This doctrine is routinely taught at USAMRD to managers and, te and technicians of field deployable laboratory units. The events that unfolded at Wallingford, Connecticut Postal Facility represent to a large part, a lack of knowledge and experience with the biological data. In reality, local government officials and the Postal Service could not have anticipated the requirement for this knowledge or experience prior to the events of September and October of 2001. Moreover, experience with anthrax spores was available at relatively few locations in the United States. The lack of experience and knowledge exasperated the problems with the post-attack response. First, methods for collecting samples consistent with the physical and biological characteristics of the material were poorly understood. Misunderstandings led to delays in reporting and the implementation of workforce protective measures. Secondly, only a small number of laboratories were capable of reliably detecting and identifying Bacillus anthracis. This resulted in the reliance upon procedures that were not adequately validated producing disparate results with further delays in the implementation of protective measures. We are pleased that an ongoing collaboration among the Department of Defense, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of validated methods and protocols will be developed later this year. The most important lessons learned from these tragic events can be summarized in four basic points. First, in the absence of reasonable surety, always err on the side of caution. Second, Develop procedures for validation of test data that are based upon sound and experienced scientific ju judgment. However, the clinical data 
will be the hardest to obtain. We ne be, may never be able to definitively define the risk, especially in low dose exposures as occurred in the Wallingford Postal Facility. Third, we must make efficient and maximum use of all available expertise to help develop concepts of operation that will provide the greatest margin of safety for the public. Finally, we must make every effort to ensure that this expertise, this national resource, both in government and in academia, is maintained and expanded by increasing opportunities for dedicated scientists and technicians that have been responsible for preparing for this and future bioterrorism events. I thank the subcommittee for its time and would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you very much. We're going to start with Mr. Ruppersberg. Five minutes, I think, the first pass, then, then we'll go to uh, Mr. Janklow and then to uh, Ms. Delora and then myself. Okay. Well, first, uh, <clears throat> we have to learn from our past experiences. I think, uh, Dr. Hamilton, was you talking about leadership and I think uh, we and what agency would be responsible. Um, we are, as we relate after what happened in 9-11 and with the anthrax issue, we're learning as we go. The good news for the United States of America, I believe that, that our agencies are doing well, working together as a team, but we can continue to do better. And when we have a situ situation, uh, as we had in Connecticut, uh, we need to learn from that. Um, I said when I started my opening statement <clears throat> that I visited the, the uh, facility that was manufacturing the, uh, really, I guess it's called a biodetection system, um, and in being, it's being manufactured in, in conjunction with, I think, Northrop Grumman and Davis, uh, industries and, uh, and, and really looked at it <coughs> and saw it in use. Um, right now, that has been used in, in the Baltimore facility, and um, I, I understand it's what it, it's, the term is zero test positive. Is that the correct scientific indication? And th I would like to know your opinion about the bio detect <coughs> detection system that has been uh, in use in Baltimore, and so far there, there ha it has worked well. Do you agree with that? Do you know anything about that, that equipment? Anyone, anyone? May I ask a question? Sure. Has it been validated using positive controls? I assume it has. Well, I'm asking you the question. <clears throat> and if you don't I, know, maybe well, there's someone a, else on the panel who might not. I have a concern not. that it probably wasn't. And, and that's it. I mean, you, well, it's, been, it's been in 14 different areas. Uh, you have to look at the, I think, the weather conditions. You have to look at a lot of different issues. But so far, from what we have been told, that it has been working based on the test system. I, I don't know, and I understand it's going to be going out in the 14 other areas if it's not there already. Uh, we, what we want to do here is just get it right, and we want to make sure that, that, we do, that we can protect our employees and, and our customers and, and the Postal Service uh, because of what has happened here. And if, if in fact, this technology is working, uh, I want to know if anyone here has the knowledge of it. That's my, my uh, really, it's my question. Uh, sir, I have s small knowledge about it. Some of the core technology actually was derived from uh, technology and gene amplifications uh, uh, devices that were developed by the Department of Defense and then transferred to a commercial manufacturer. Um, one of the, the, uh, the devices are currently being evaluated mostly with surrogates for anthrax. It's not possible uh, to test s these devices with large amounts of anthrax spores, as you can imagine. And so they do test these devices with surrogates for anthrax. These are related organisms that don't cause disease. Um, the focus, if I'm not mistaken, of the technology that's being tested at Baltimore is primarily um, through a high volume collection of air, which is then tested using a single gene amplification technology. Uh, there may be other components to the system that I'm not aware. Uh, one of the problems that I think in that is that I think to really define the risk and to be able to detect an attack there may have to be some other technologies involved, such as surface sampling or protocols for surface sampling as well. Um, I'm not sure that relying completely upon high volume air sampling is the only solution. And that let me ask you this, in, the, in, the, in that air sampling, and that's the technology that, that is in use there, uh, what about any other bio agents other than anthrax? Well, that's, that's an excellent point <laughs> in that when we start to look at technologies and protocols for detecting a terrorist attack, we almost we have to validate against all of the most likely threats that we will face. The protocols that we validate for anthrax may not be appropriate for some other threat, such as ricin toxin. 
And I don't believe yet that we've been able to do those studies. Well, I would suggest anyone involved in this very important issue, and I'm sure that, that um, Homeland Security is, going, is being involved also, uh, find out as much as they can about the, the equipment that's being used in the, in the Baltimore operation now. Because uh, my staff has contacted the, the United States Post Office, and from what we get from them, that they, they feel very good about what's happened so far with that equipment. Um, and, you know, all we're trying to do is get whatever we need to deal with the issue so that we can protect lives. Um, one other question. Uh, uh, <coughs> resources. Uh, any any uh, indication of where we are with respect to resources um, to, to continue re to research, to look at equipment, uh, um, personnel? You have an opinion on, on resources and are they lacking now and where you think we need to go? Anybody on the panel want to answer that one? One of the, uh, one of the resource issues uh, is amongst the diagnostic laboratories. Um, initially, um, after the fall uh, anthrax attack, um, one of the limitations on uh, the ability of the Postal Service uh, to get its samples reviewed was that the network of qualified uh, diagnostic laboratories was limited. Um, obviously, if there's, if there's funding there, if uh, either Homeland Security or whomever, if the federal government is willing to uh, put the funding into that um, to meet the risk associated with a bioterror event, um, then we won't have this bottleneck that occurred in uh, September and October of 2001 because that was part of some of the discussion about what sampling methods were employed, uh, was what laboratory uh, can handle what sampling method within a reasonable time period. Time's up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Governor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Colonel, m most of my lifetime I've, uh, I've read news reports about uh, research that our country, the old Soviet Union, now Russia, have done on uh, sub, uh, substances like anthrax. Uh, did the Postal Service ever contact uh, the Department of the Army, uh, specifically yours or any other organization with respect to the testing uh, that they were doing or what kind of contractor they ought to hire or what kind of protocols they ought to have in, in their testing analysis? Obviously, they didn't contact John Hopkins. Did they contact you folks? Uh, through, through the fall, when the attacks were occurring in 2001, um, our contact was mostly with law enforcement agencies. As I remember, shortly after the 1st of January, after January, um, we did begin to be contacted by post officials, and um, we had uh, a few teleconferences as well as visits to discuss the problem, but mostly the context of the discussions involved trying to identify the technologies for future systems. But, I don't recall. But by that time, they've had two or three sets of their own testing done. Uh, I don't recall any time where we were, had a chance to review that data. I don't recall any time of having a chance to review the protocols that they were using. Colonel, we talk about spores, um, 8,000 or 10,000 or whatever we think it may take. A spoonful would be how many spores? I mean, what are we talking about in terms of size? Uh, pra practically uncountable. We're really talking about, you know, a magnitude of spores in a tablespoon that would be beyond test. I mean, beyond our ability to. to you really mean if we had a spoonful? To 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 quantitatively give you a description of that. So exact when we number. say eight to ten thousand, it's a big number, but it's a very small mass. Uh, that is exactly correct. The, you know, in my state, I come from South Dakota. We have anthrax and livestock virtually every other year. As a matter of fact, we had a veterinarian that caught it last year, um, the cutaneous kind. Um, it, it's not that unusual. I mean, it's rare, but it's not, it's, it's not that unusual. Has the Army done research going back decades? Uh, the stories I've read most of my life, are they true? I'm not sure what stories you've read, but, but the well, Army I've is read that the Soviet Union and the American and some of the other armed forces of the world have, the Iraqis have done extensive amounts of research with respect to anthrax. And so 
what I'm what I'm getting at is if we've done this research, do we have a reservoir of knowledge from which we can go on the shelf and get information now that it's out in the civilian population? Well, we agree, and at USAMR, we've, we've had a pretty much a 34-year history of evaluating the studies primarily from the medical aspects, not environmental aspects. But, but I agree that even during the attacks of 2001, there was insufficient exchange of information that would have uh, possibly helped interpretation of the results. Is the information, as far as you know, that the Army has now, is it open and available to the civilian, the general law enforcement and medical and uh, epidemiological uh, civilian authorities? Uh, generally, the, the protocols that we have and the testing methods that we have actually are available. Um, and, and more could be provided uh, through um, uh, opportunities for interagency You scare exchange. me, sir. What do you mean more could be provided? What aren't they asking you for, and where is it? There is, uh, for the most part, we're an open scientific uh, literature uh, laboratory, which means that we do have a lot of knowledge that we've already published in the, in the scientific literature. Um, but I think that there is, because we have a body of scientists that use SAMR, they have a lot of institutional knowledge. And I think through uh, more peer-reviewed and, and scientific exchanges, if those could be um, encouraged, uh, more information may be available. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, in the research you did preparing for your testimony, in the report that you wrote, did, did the Postal Service indicate what it would do if it had to do over again? What would it do differently? Yes. Um, Could they you did. tell us what that is? Well, what they, what, they, uh, what they would do differently is that they would use, I mean, we were told that they would use. They wouldn't use the dry swab. No, what they else? wouldn't. They would use the aggressive methods. Uh, Whoever told them to use the dry swab? Who was the, the, who was the genius that came up with that one? Well, and then they contracted for it, so obviously the contractor wasn't much brighter than the contractee. I mean, the dry swab was uh, a method that was being used at the time, and it was the method that they applied. Um, the Centers for Disease Control did issue comment saying that they should uh, add water to it. They should wet it with uh, uh, one to two drops of water on the swab. But uh, as the colonel has pointed out and as Dr. Hamilton has pointed out, um, this was an evolving process. It was necessary for people to learn as they went. Uh, what we learned was people were trying to interpret and apply existing methods and procedures that weren't applicable necessarily directly to the uh, environmental capture of Bacillus anthracis. In some cases, they were employing uh, uh, mold spore uh, methods. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delora. Hey. Thank you very much. If I could just um, f follow up on my colleague's comment. Uh, um, with the acceptable technology, dry swabs, wet swabs, wet wipes, HEPA vacuum, amongst those, is there a, a um, is one better than the other? The is one more efficient than the other? Are two more efficient than the other? Um, and if, that, if, if that's the case, if there's a differential and we know that there's one that's better than the other, why aren't we using the best? And help me if that's a... Uh, well, I, uh, I think that um, why aren't we using the best? I think now uh, the best would be applied. That's what would what, that be? Well, it would be a combination, uh, as was seen uh, when the Centers for Disease Control went into the Wallingford facility and used wet wipes as well as the HEPA vacuums. In, com in combination, uh, they found uh, 3 million spore on machine number 10. But my, my point is, did we know that wet is better than dry before we started the process in Wallingford so that that body of knowledge or that information that, and, and I don't know who the contractor was um, mm -hmm. either, but the fact is if within the literature of this effort, is there one process better than another? And then why don't we just jettison what we don't believe works and move to what we want to have, what we know works? Ma'am, if I may. Yes, I have the, a follow-up question. The, the wet too. swab method actually was 
uh, derived from some methods that had evolved at USAMRD, especially for when we were working with animals. Uh, but with regard to your specific question the best about one? the well, the, with regard to your specific question, you actually needed an integrated approach. Okay. There are many different uh, variables when you start trying to sample an environment. Um, you may need HEPA filter vacuums for chairs or for rugs, uh, but you know wet swabs are more appropriate for some kinds of surfaces, and so you have to have really an integration of different methods as you approach that problem. I, I want to get to another One question, but my, my my point is, usually in these situations, and it was a brand new situation, understandably, but the fact is you don't have much time. You have to move quickly. It would seem to me if we do have information, if we do have processes and procedures, and we know which are the ones the best to go to, then let's move in that direction. Let me follow up. My time is going to be out in a few seconds here, and, and I don't want to right. beg the indulgence of the chairman. Uh, Colonel uh, Henschel, um, what constitutes being exposed to anthrax? And can you walk through a room where spores have been found, expose a person enough to become sick, given that we had three million spores um, uh, identified uh, here. How many spores need to be present to affect a person? In your judgment, how much of a risk did the Postal Service take by not informing workers or even visitors uh, to the facility of the results of the anthrax uh, uh, tests? And in the report, they talk about trace amounts, which is what was described to the workers. With the three million, with what we know about the situation, was this a trace amount? Uh, first, let me say that the question of exposure is a difficult one, as you can already imagine this. Um, in order to be exposed, not only does the organism have to be there, it has to be there in a form in which you can take it into your body or it can be, absor be, be absorbed onto the skin. In order to be an inhalation hazard, it has to actually be on a particle of a particular size. Uh, it has to be a very small, what we call five microns in, in size or less. Um, in order to be uh, exposed and then get an infection through the skin, you have to have a way for the, for the spore to land on your skin and be there and then enter a break in the skin. Uh, and so whether or not any particular individual is at risk depends upon a number of different variables. It may also depend upon the health status of that individual. Um, whether or not exposure to one anthrax spore is sufficient depends upon whether or not that spore has an opportunity to enter your body and then initiate that infection. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know. We don't know why some people get sick and why others do not. But the three million spores here, I visited the facility on, uh, on December 11th, 2001, and where we had made the discovery there. Now, the, the, the workers, as I understand it, at that juncture were told that there were trace amounts. I'm not particularly concerned about myself, but I was there. Uh, was I then, or anyone else who was at that large gathering, including staff, people, etc., exposed? to anthrax. You were probably exposed, but the risk of infection may have been small. And the reason for that is because the spores, if they attach to paper waste, then have a particle size that is too large for you to take into your lung and for the infection to initiate. It's possible that under those conditions, the risk is small. Mm -hmm. um, if the anthrax spores are fixed onto the surface of the machine, on the metal of the machine. You probably have a low risk of infection unless there's some way to transfer those spores to your skin. But those workers then, day in and day out, that they were there were exposed, and they certainly have much more to do with the machinery than I did. And then I'll just say, would it have been prudent, as we did here when we found difficulties, to shut down this plant, explain to the workers what their exposure or risk was, do what we needed to do to clean it up, and then have them go back afterward. Uh, I would agree that the workers were exposed, but uh, that I can't make a decision uh, uh, 
or a recommendation this time about whether or not the plant should have been closed. Thank you very much. Thank you for your forbearance. Th th no, no forbearance necessary. They're great questions. I'm going to take my five minutes. Then the next round we'll do ten minutes so we can have a little bit more um, in-depth question. I, I, um, I, for some reason, I've been dreading this hearing. I'm not quite sure. I, we had so many, my, my previous committee had so many hearings on anthrax before September 11th. Um, and we had all these preconceptions. We had a preconception that uh, once you had the symptoms, that once they appeared, you were dead. You know, a few days later, you were going to die. And we had a preconception, though, that it took a lot of the spores to kill you. Mm -hmm. And since then, we, we know we can treat it with antibiotics, very aggressive, and potentially with a vaccine even after. And that it, it probably doesn't take a, a lot of the spores to kill you. Uh, but we don't know which spores or you know, which kind of, under what conditions and about your health and so on. I want to ask you, Dr. Rhodes, first, what are the most significant concerns that led you to make the recommendations included in your testimony? I guess the primary uh, concern that I have is that the uncertainty of infection. Um, as, as you stated in your uh, statement, in effect, zero is not zero and one is equal to a million if you're the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, if you look at the fall of 2001 and you compare it to the accident in uh, Sverdlovsk in uh, the former Soviet Union um, where the uh, bio uh, production, the anthrax production center there had a uh, somewhat equivalent release of uh, anthrax into the community, um, you can see that you know, the official numbers from the former Soviet Union are that between 60 and 70 people died. Uh, the unofficial estimates from outside sources are that somewhere between 300 and 400 people died. Um, we aren't talking about anthrax out of that facility that's um, less potent than what was sent through the mail. If you look at a uh, 94-year-old Connecticut woman with a suppressed immune system succumbing to an, uh, an unmeasurable amount of anthrax. That's the concern that we have, is that when we're talking about the general population, both in terms of the postal workers as well as the general public, you're not talking about animal extrapolation now. You're not talking about healthy males between the ages of 18 and 26. You're not talking about people who have biodefense gear with them. That's the main concern, is the uncertainty. Now, and it is also true, isn't it, that you uh, have no conviction that other postal facilities are free from anthrax. In other words, they could have be contaminated. Is that Yes, they that could. Those, and that's why we make the recommendation structured the way we say it. For those facilities deemed free of anthrax based on a single sample done with dry swab, that's the least effective method. Right. Um, Therefore, we can make no assumption that they aren't contaminated. Well, that's, and, that's and we have to assume, in one sense, that they may be. Uh, therefore, test and the testing has to be extraordinarily aggressive. Correct. That's our recommendation okay. to reassess the risk and whether the facility should be retested. Dr. Hamilton, do you think that our other facilities could mm -hmm. be contaminated? Well, I, I would support what was just said in the sense that um, the methods that were reportedly used are not definitive and weren't really validated. And therefore, we really can't, we really can't know, f know with a confidence level that, in fact, those facilities are clean or are negative. In other words, there could be false negative results, which right. we now believe did occur. And so this recommendation, I think, is a very, very excellent one. <coughs> how one goes about doing it. Sorry. Tell me this, uh, given your expertise, how did you react after September 11th? What, what, what surprised you the most about this whole effort with anthrax to the exposure and the attempt to, to detect it and to treat it? The most concerning thing to me was the use of so many different protocols by different groups within the federal government that weren't communicating with each other. Okay. 
and the fact that in, in the case of the U.S. postal system, they may have adopted a procedure that might have been suboptimal in terms of pulling samples off of a surface. And so and the, and the communication issue has been dealt with very effectively by the GAO report. But the end result was that we need to develop a consensus guideline for an optimized surface collection and uh, testing strategy. And that's what surprised me the most of all the things. Now that may be, I, I, I look for what I hope uh, I can appreciate the bottom line of the hearing, but that strikes me that it, that may be the core message here. But yes. uh, before giving um, my colleague uh, his 10 minutes for a second round, um, should I be surprised that there wasn't a protocol? I mean, it seems kind of basic. With all the hearings we've had with scientists over the course of the last eight years, uh, it, this seems to me like what you would do in grammar school. In other words, you, you, this would be kind of basic stuff. In, in laboratory science, in running a clinical laboratory, we have positive controls, we have validation of our procedures, essentially well established. So this is a, this should be a no question, a no brainer. And the fact that there was lack of, have to appreciate that it was done in haste and there was an urgency. So I appreciate that, that fact. But it's been now um, quite a few months after the fact, and we still are in the same spot. And that's what concerns me, is we need an agency to pull this together. We need to get some, some support for that agency. To, and then we need to, to, div to validate these procedures. And those are my three recommendations. And I still believe that, that they're supported by this one recommendation that GAO made. When uh, government employees were being tested in, in the Capitol, um, this was after the exposures uh, in Leahy's office and Dashiell's office, contamination. My employees were being sent to the Hart building to be tested. Interesting. <laughs> and so was everyone else's. <laughs> Mr. Rupersberger, sure. you had the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Well, let's get back. We want to, when the hearing is over, we would hope we can accomplish something and then we can make some recommendations. <clears throat> and right now, <clears throat> we're hearing that, that there needs to be one agency that is going to have to pull all this together. Do you have any recommendations on what agency that would be? Uh, or let me ask that question and then go through the panel. Yeah, Mr. Unger. Uh, yes, sir. It would seem as though with the recent creation of the Department of Homeland Security that that would probably be the appropriate location because we have so many different federal agencies here that are involved, Postal Service, EPA, OSHA, Department of Health and Human Services, plus needing uh, co coordination with uh, state and local health departments plus others. Okay. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yes, yes? Yes. Okay. Well, it, it, for the record, so it yes. shows up, uh, maybe we could get a... a, a, a vocal response. I concur with my colleague's uh, opinion. Uh, I also concur very much so. I concur also. Now, let me go through the line again. The resources that you think would be needed as it relates to this issue so that that agency could properly pull it together and buy the, the, the necessary equipment to be able to determine that procedures are validated and that we can, we can protect our, our employees and customers. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I don't know uh, immediately if it's a question of uh, additional resources right now. I think the first is the leadership and initiative to call the parties together. Uh, and I, I don't think it's a question of uh, there being no action right now because there are a series of uh, activities going on now to uh, pull together the uh, federal government's uh, approach to dealing with these kinds of emergencies. Uh, I guess the question is what what is the pace that that's being carried out with right now? And then once a, a real uh, a game plan is developed, then the question of what additional resources would be necessary. And that that, that kind of information we don't have, at least in GAO at this point. You know, I would probably uh, you know, agree <coughs> with you with Homeland Defense except for one thing. In my opinion right now, Home, Homeland Defense has not been given the resources it needs to do what it needs. I think <clears throat> now that we have finished our war with Iraq, we have a lot more to do there, but hopefully we can bring in other countries to help us pay for what needs to be done. We can refocus on first responders and do what we need to do. But if you're going to ask for money, you have to justify it, and that's important. I'm not going to get off that BDS system because I know from at least from what I personally have seen and what I think the postal officials will say, that that system seems to be working well and they feel very secure that it's not giving false positives. 
but I think it's important that if, there's, if that testing has been done, that the entire community come together and at least look at it, because I would like someone else's opinion uh, if, from, with respect to that piece of equipment. If, if yes. I could make a comment, the um, surface samples were the samples that gave us the real information. So if that device is designed around air sampling, a word of caution to the wise. Mm -hmm. No question. And that, I think, Colonel, you brought up that issue. We need I mean, more scientific <coughs> peer review. Uh, I would recommend uh, that I think I agree that the leadership issue is the most critical one. Um, Always is. Uh, we, we, we really need to be able to compare agency by agency about what technologies are really available and then be able to make really thoughtful recommendations to the to the Congress and others on what should be the next now, step. I have a, a suggestion and would like your comments on it. I remember or I, I think that what we have <coughs> always will have serious issues as it relates to drugs and drugs, drug uh, interdiction, uh, drug, drug uh, uh, law enforcement areas. And one of the most successful programs was when and uh, was when all law enforcement, federal, state and local <coughs> came together in a strike force type of situation and why I think that worked. I mean, you had the FBI, I think, got jurisdiction, you had DEA, you had state police and local governments. But in a strike force situation, you had a group of people targeting on one issue. They developed relationships and trust. And it seems to me that somehow we need something like that rather quickly because as far as I'm concerned, time is a wasting. You know, you have, you have uh, employees right now that I'm sure do not feel very secure as it relates to their health. That's not a very good working condition. And I think it's very important that somehow, and that's why I'm sure we're having this hearing today, that we're focusing on the best way to get it started. And, and when I walk out of here, the number one issue you're talking about is leadership. Where does this go, number two? And then how do you deal with the issue of, of early detection and rapid response? Now, one other question before my time runs out. Where, what do you think we could do as it relates to the employees as far as communication is concerned? looking at where, how we handled it in the past and what do you think we could do now as it relates to communication to, to the employees who are, who are there every day and, and are, feel rather probably insecure with, based on even some of the testimony today. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the first thing and, uh, that we had recommended, and I think everybody, uh, uh, the Postal Service, EPA, and all the other federal groups that uh, commented is that, that there needs to be a good federal guideline on communication. The agencies need to be brought together again by good leadership to, to reach an agreement on what type of information and what kind of information ought to be provided to employees. And in a nutshell, in, in the Wallingford situation, it's very clear that the information was not pro sufficient information on the quantitative results, uh, or in, as a matter of fact, even the qualitative results was not provided to employees quickly enough. Uh, for example, Mr. Laurie was, was talking about she was there on December, uh, excuse me, yeah, December 11th. Well, the, the test results uh, with respect to the 3 million spores were available to CDC and to the Connecticut Department of Public Health on December 6th. And uh, prior to that time, uh, the, the trace amounts had been identified, but the employees were not informed about even the, the term concentration until December 12th. So there's a six-day delay between the time public health authorities knew about the uh, contamination being so extensive in the time that the employees were informed about the extensiveness of it. So there's definitely a need to get more prompt and complete communication to the folks. But there has to be a, a program or a system set up. One thing I would suggest is that you, when you have a system set up, there can be a manual set up. I mean, a lot of jurisdictions throughout the country are doing that in the event that there's any type of, of terrorism situation. But one of the things that I think would make employees feel more secure is to have an employee as a part of that group that's going to help analyze and disseminate that information. Put my five, oh, this is a 10 minute one. That's why, <laughs> more time, okay. Um, let me see, what are the, uh, oh, <clears throat> getting back to, <clears throat> to the BDS system, and not because it's being, they're manufactured in my jurisdiction, but let me ask you this question. <laughs> Based on, on what you're saying and the different, different technology or, or testing mechanisms that are out there, would it not, would that system, depending on what your analysis of it is, be, be a part of the, um, the systems that should be used in conjunction with other systems to, to make sure that we're on top of it? In other words, if that system is what you think it is right now, and um, would that be a part of something that we should have in our portfolio, so to speak, to be able to deal with this situation uh, as far as anthrax concerned or any other agent such as anthrax? Yeah, I, I agree that it could be part of a total system, 
it has to be integrated with many different approaches for how you look at and evaluate the contamination of instruments and surfaces and everything. Uh, what's more important is for us to be able to have a scientific peer review of the performance to date um, and, and make sure that we have good consensus on that performance. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Unger. Yes, so I'd just like to add a couple things. One, uh, GAO did look at the, the biodetection system early on and, and had uh, a number of recommendations that we made to the Postal Service about uh, making sure that the appropriate testing was done, and, and I believe the, the Postal Service did agree with that, and it did make some changes to its testing mm -hmm. of that equipment. We also plan, uh, as far as I know, to look at that again uh, here soon. And the third point I'd like to make is that we agree with you that, that the um, – the biodetection system just needs to be a part of a, a much larger uh, a sense, uh, assessment in the Postal Service about how to deal with this issue of security. There are many different uh, things that, that are uh, coming into play here. And, and for example, the whole process that the Postal Service uses to process mail, uh, we held a conference back in December of 2001 at the request of some members of the committee, the full committee, in which a number of ideas were thrown out in terms of looking at the different way anonymous mail was processed versus uh, on mail from known mailers and other aspects of the postal system in terms of, of being able to identify uh, who the mailers are and being able to handle mail in a manner in which if it is ha unfortunately contaminated, it doesn't contaminate the whole facility once it gets inside the facility. Yes, Dr. Um, Hamilton. With regard to funding and support. John's Hopkins? John's Hopkins. Where's right? that in located? your district, actually. <laughs> well, just outside your district. Um, in fact, I live in your district. Um, so. One, uh, one issue with regard to extramural support for academic and, and industrial uh, researchers would be to go to NIH, which is funded to study infectious disease, and expand their scope so they could include this as one of their, their areas of, of investigation. They have closed out this whole area of environmental testing and have only focused on the medical, ap medical issues related to anthrax. And it would be an immediate, easy approach to getting I'm sorry, getting extramural funding for external uh, investigators in academic and government and, and industrial facilities. That's a very good suggestion, but again, we're going to have to refocus our priorities, and hopefully this will be made a priority for Homeland Security yes, to get exactly. the resources that we need to do it. That's one of the major issues right now. Thank you. Governor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I guess I have to ask you, Mr. Rhodes. On November 11th, they conducted tests at the facility, Wellington facility. November 21st, they conducted tests. November 25th, they conducted tests. And it wasn't until the 28th tests that they then found the 3 million spores or they found any positive tests at all. Do we know or don't we know whether or not the anthrax came into that facility before or after the 25th of November? Could, I, could you repeat your question again? Well, do we what know I'm trying what? to find out is, do we know whether or not anthrax was present in the facility on November 11th, November 21st, and number, November 25th, when the dry swabs tested negative? I, I'm not arguing the efficacy of the dry versus wet or some other kind of testing. As much as I'm asking the question, do we or don't we know at what point in time the anthrax spores came into the facility at Wellington? We have, we have an idea of when it came in. I mean, we don't know exactly. Based on what? Well, based on, based on reverse trace of the mail uh, that went to uh, uh, Ms. Lundgren's home. I mean, you can, read, you can read the barcode on the mail and you find out exactly uh, what machine handled it and what date it passed through. Was this the 94-year-old lady? Yes. Was there anthrax in that letter at her house? Well, there wasn't any anthrax found but she did die of inhalation anthrax. Okay, but we do, do we know whether, and this is important, I mean, because we may be drawing bad conclusions. Do we, or, do we know or don't we know that, it, that the anthrax she got came through the Postal Service? Well, the assumption. No, do we know? Do you know? Yes, sir. Um, we know, we, that the, we? We, we know that there was, uh, there were uh, uh, another case of, uh, uh, anthra uh, bacillus anthracis spores were found along the uh, mail route. Uh, okay. We also know that the... the uh, um, Sorry, I probably didn't ask my question very clear. Let me ask it another way. One of the delivery vehicles was contaminated Did we find well. any anthrax at all in this lady's house, the 94-year-old's house? No. 
Did we find any on her letter? No. So we don't know how she was exposed to anthrax. We can assume it, but we don't know how she was exposed, do we? That is true. Okay. We don't know. We do not know exactly how she was exposed. We don't have the concrete evidence that sure, you keep for. saying that. I mean, like somehow there's an that it was the Postal Service. We're concluding that without evidence. What we have at best is slight circumstances, circumstantial evidence. Well, since the last naturally occurring yes, case of inhalation you, the anthrax that delivered the mail to her house was his pouch tested. I assume it yes. was. Do you know whether or not they ever found anthrax in that? Yes, I think they did. If I recall right, they did find anthrax in the in the vehicle and uh, in the uh, mail carrier's bag. I think. Okay. Did they? Did they trying find? To I'm trying to recall those details. Did Sorry. they find any anthrax in in the other houses along that route? Well, there was one other house where they found anthrax on the mail. Okay. And when that one was the person, uh, did the person get anthrax? No, did not. Did not get sick. The, um, the protocols that we're talking about, do we have a set now? It's two years later, almost a year, it's, it's year and a half later. Do, do we have, Dr. Hamilton, do we have protocols in place or, or kernel now that, that are uniform in terms of the testing process or modality that's going to be followed? Yes and no. We have protocols in place that have been established by several groups. They're published. Are they optimized or validated? The answer, in my opinion, is no. But can they be improved readily and rapidly? And the answer is yes. And in fact, we've written 12 suggestions in our testimony that, of things that could be done immediately that would uh, essentially bring some of the methodologies up to a, a reasonable level. C Colonel, I'm, uh, I'm digging an old memory, but wasn't there something 20, 25 years ago where there were some sheep in Utah or Idaho, a bunch of them that died, and it was later... That was nerve gas. Was that nerve gas? Okay. H have we ever, as far as you know, contacted the Russians for their help in determining how much anthrax it may take to kill people and testing process, et cetera? Do any uh, of you know I, that? I'm not, aw I'm not aware of... Uh, it, it's been sometimes very difficult to find... Uh, the information in the former Soviet program, as you know, there hasn't been always complete openness in that program. I understand. My question was, have we tried? Oh, we have certainly tried. And we, we continue to work through a program called the Th Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Um, but uh, being able to um, get the right dialogue has always been a challenge. Is the program that we have where the United States assists in getting rid of former weapons of the Soviet Union, is that just a nuclear program, the one we spent $7 billion on, do you know, or is that also one that involves other weapons of mass destruction? I can't comment on that. The, when I look at the materials, it indicates that the Postal Service, just the Postal Service alone in this country, there's 85 districts. There's 350 distribution and processing centers and 38,000 post offices, stations, and branches. Now, if we assume that the federal authorities, in terms of what they've said publicly, is that this is, was not a, a what I'll call, if I can say it this way, a foreign act of terror, and they feel it's a lone person that did it, let's assume for a moment that it's an organized group bent on uh, wrecking havoc in the United States that mails letters from uh, two or three hundred different areas where they have uh, distribution centers. Do we have a system in place at all to cope with that? Uh, unfortunately, sir, I'm not sure we do at this point. I think uh, when the Postal Service is up next, uh, you can ask it, but uh, Mr. Day, but I, I would really be surprised if there were a system right now that could cope with several hundred letters of the nature that were sent through uh, Trenton and Brentwood and, and eventually ended up through cross-contamination because if you are sending uh, several hundred letters, and of course there is no biodetection equipment now or any other equipment and other than the test locations, 
So if you, you take the letter, uh, several hundred letters themselves and, and going through these processing machines where they would conceptually cross-contaminate a lot of other mail, the um, amount of, of mail that would be going to different parts of the country would be enormous. Uh, and it would require a huge effort to deal with. So if I were to conclude at this point at least that the protections we have for our people, for the workers, and for the people of America at this point is probably illusory. Well, uh, hopefully the, the positive side of this, sir, is that uh, we've learned a lot of lessons uh, since the uh, last fall of, of 2001, and uh, we would be much better prepared to deal with it, but I don't think we'd be in a position to be able to stop, you know, and detect it before it got into the postal system and hopefully, you know, probably get through the postal system into the, into the public uh, before it would be detected, but hopefully we'd be a, a better able to deal with it after that happened at this point in time. Dealing with it in terms of uh, everybody running out and getting Cipro again? Well, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, I, I would hope that there would be a great cooperation and coordination between all the organizations that we do have the Homeland Security in operation but now. We, we do, sir, but given the monumental task they've got of trying to bring all these disparate agencies together, work through all of the accommodations they have to do. I mean, this is kind of trying to like to get the UN to work together. <laughs> Um, or, or 20 years ago, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, and, uh, which has gotten a lot better. But the Homeland Security Department has just come together, and I think maybe we're throwing too much of an assumption, all of us, on them in terms of what they're capable of getting done in, in weeks and, and months. Would yeah. you disagree with that? Well, it would be tough, but I think uh, at least it's there now, and, and, the, and the role is there uh, clearly before the, one of the dilemmas was there was no clear notion of who's in charge. Uh, you know, I think as Dr. Hamilton was saying, you had a, a whole a large number of agencies at the federal level. You had state and local organizations. You had public health. You had, you know, crime, uh, criminal investigation units and so forth. At least now it's a little clearer that Homeland Security is responsible. Dr. Hamilton, do you know whether or not in the, <coughs> in the academic community, people like yourself, uh, the academ academicians, the researchers, the investigators have been engaged yet in, in, in terms of anthrax and other viruses, toxins, and uh, um, uh, bacteria? Have they been engaged with respect to putting together the testing modalities and procedures and processes and the analytical aspects of it and the best protocols to follow and those types of things? It's a great question. My answer to that is I do not believe that the academic community has been mobilized because there has been no clear mission statement, unifying mission statement made to the academic community. When we go to NIH to get our grants funded, they have no, absolutely no mission in this area whatsoever. And NIAID, which should be supporting this, in fact, doesn't. So while they have the capability and they've been studying the medical as aspects of these diseases extensively, the actual design of methods for, there are those rogue places like us, like our group, where we've taken the interest in actually focusing on this issue with our own means. But uh, the answer is in general no. We have the capability of supporting the governmental facilities and the agencies, of which we're going to hear from them shortly but they've not been mobilized yet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to acknowledge the presence of Ms. Sanchez and uh, the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich, both uh, uh, request Ms. Delora go next. I will be asking Dr. Hamilton for you to illustrate uh, our detection capability. I believe that you are the sample. I'll do that after Ms. Sanchez. I mean, excuse me, after Ms. Delora is done. Ms. Delora. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my colleagues uh, a, a, as well. In the, in the GA re GAO report that came out in April of 2003, um, I, I know that there was real concurrence on the notion of a single agency uh, housed uh, with, uh, with Homeland Security. I, I, I believe as well that we're probably overwhelming this, this, this agency, but, but nevertheless. But that was not the kind of a recommendation that was made within the GAO report, and um, uh, in addition to which, in, the, in the, a, a further conversation with Dr. Hamilton, that the coordination of these kinds of efforts along with an academic community uh, was a, a, a not listed uh, uh, as, as a recommendation uh, as well to incorporate the body of knowledge uh, that the academic community has 
uh, here. If the, 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 the notion has been, why didn't you make the recommendation right. on a, um, uh, a single agency, Department of Homeland Security, right. academic community in your, in your efforts here? Good question. Uh, there, uh, I, we have a good re a reason. The reason we didn't is because that effort on Wallingford was the first step in, in, in a series of reviews that we are going to be doing in this area. And we, this one on testing is another one. We're currently doing work at several different postal facilities uh, that were uh, affected by anthrax to see, uh, uh, actually compare them to Wallingford and look at the roles and responsibilities in a little broader context than we did at just the one facility. So we really wanted to look at more facilities. We certainly wouldn't d disagree with Dr. Hamilton, and I, and I don't want to be too much of an optimist. We were somewhat disappointed because one of the agencies that was not involved, of course it wasn't created at the time this was going on, was Homeland Security. Uh, we did send a draft of our report to the department, but unfortunately it didn't respond <laughs> to our draft or uh, didn't comment on it, including the recommendations. So we were somewhat disappointed there. How many agencies are now involved? Uh, well, there are several. Uh, there, uh, the ones that were most heavily involved were the Department of Health and Human Services and several components, uh, including Centers for Disease Control but there were some, and Prevention, but there were some others. Uh, uh, Department of Labor with OSHA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Army Corps of Engineers helped with the cleanup. Uh, of course, the Postal Service uh, was, was uh, very deeply involved and continues to be. And then, of course, there were state and local health departments uh, the FBI was involved, and we could go on. Well, you then, if I understand you clearly, you are going to make a, a further recommendation about consolidating these uh, efforts and housing these, this particular function of those agencies in one place, either with the Homeland Security or in, a, in a, another single agency to do, th to do this? Uh, Mr. Loro, uh, I'm not exactly sure how it will come out in the, in the report. We are addressing that issue directly, and it sounds at this point to be a logical direction to take, but I'm not quite clear exactly where what we'll end up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, further to, to Dr. Rose and, and uh, Mr. Unger, uh, the GAO's report found that the Postal Service decision not to release the test results was understandable for a number of reasons, one of which was, quote, the advice it received from public health officials. Uh, during uh, his testimony, Dr. Rhodes, you, you said that public health uh, must focus on prevention. In order that you focus on prevention, it seems that people need to be fully informed of the risks that they, that they take. Can you tell us exactly what advice the USPS, the Postal Service, received from public health officials that led them to withhold this information? Um, so I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, this was a very difficult and challenging situation uh, at the time. Uh, 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 all this was happening it was a crisis situation, and there were many different agencies involved, as we indicated. Mm -hmm. They're involved in the Wallingford uh, case, who, as you probably know, with the FBI being a, doing a criminal investigation in public health. We had a, a very difficult time trying to ferret out exactly what happened back in 2001 when this was taking place. We, we talked to all the relevant parties and, and got somewhat conflicting information we couldn't resolve. Uh, Dr. Hadler, who you'll hear from uh, shortly, basically uh, told us that he discussed this at length with the Postal Service and uh, uh, identified a number of optional ways in which the Postal Service could communicate the, 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 the situation to the post uh, employees. On the other hand, uh, the uh, Connecticut postal officials who we spoke to said that they really perceived that he directly recommended use of the terms trace and concentration. So we had a little bit of a disconnect there that we were unable to resolve. Uh, one reason was that uh, uh, obviously recollections are probably fading now because that happened so long ago. And the other issue was that th there was no documentation kept us, so we were told uh, identifying or documenting, you know, what individuals uh, said or advised uh, or what people heard at the time, and that's one of the recommendations uh, that we did make. Mm -hmm. um, with, in terms of your current recommendations, and a, a quick answer, what is the process for oversight of those recommendations now, and how is that going to proceed? Uh, which, which ones? The ones in our report or the, the ones, ones in, we just... Well, the ones in, in, in your report. You told me that you're going to do some other work in terms of the yes. single agency concept, and... Yes, and hopefully coordination with an academic community, but in terms of the, 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 the procedures you have here. Yes, in terms of the recommendations in our report, uh, they're basically, the next step is for each of the agencies to, to which we made a recommendation uh, within 60 days of the date of the, uh, uh, the report was released, 
is to write a letter to, to this committee, the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs, and to the Appropriations Committees uh, detailing the actions that they've taken and plan to take. And of course, we will follow up uh, with that, those agencies to assure that, you know, at least to report on what they've done. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hamilton, how should and how can tests be, be, be validated? Or every time this comes up, we're going to say we can't validate the tests, therefore? Well, in the clinical lab, we use positive controls to validate mm -hmm. the test. And by validate, I mean look at the performance characteristics, <laughs> the minimum detectable concentration, the reproducibility, mm -hmm. the quantitative features of it. Why couldn't we validate those tests, or at least the basis on which we, we uh, said in the report that you know, we didn't, we couldn't validate, therefore we couldn't give accurate information to people. Why couldn't we validate well, those Well, I tests? think we can validate them. We didn't validate them at the time this event happened. I think it was, it happened in hindsight. Clearly, we know that so this So we needs could have, but didn't. Ma'am, if I could. Sure. There were actually very few places where those, it were live anthrax could be used at that time, and there were actually very few people okay. who had enough okay. familiarity with the agent mm -hmm. to do the validations. Mm -hmm. You might remember that the two major centers for working with anthrax and many other biological warfare agents are places like USAMRID and the CDC in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But you, you can do that in your facility, Dr. Hamilton, is to validate? What we're doing is working with Edgewood Arsenal right up the road from us, yeah. uh, the Army. Okay. And uh, they have the facilities. We can use surrogates in our laboratory, but the final testing will be done at Edgewood and or Dugway, the two facilities that can do this well. And um, in fact, I think we'll hear from that, uh, from NIOSH, that in fact some of this is being done. Uh, was the term trace amounts, the information that was passed on to the uh, workers in the, in the facility, doc Dr. Hamilton, Colonel Henschel, um, uh, was that misleading as to their risk and their their potential uh, 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 health? In well, your professional view? <laughs> In my opinion, it's a very confusing term that's undefined, and terminology is one of the one of the statements or one of the recommendations of the GAO report to clarify the terminology. So I said I would say yes, mm -hmm. it's it's confusing and misleading and misleading. Thank you. Well, I, I agree it's a confusing term. Um, uh, whether it was done intentionally, I, I can't comment well, on that. But, no. but one problem is, is it's difficult to I mean, interpret that kind of suspend a second. No one was suggesting it was intentional. I'm right. not suggesting I, I understand. I apologize no. for the remark. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to interpret that result, and I think that's what they were faced with. This brings up the issue of units, which, uh, again, one of our recommendations in our testimony was to use colony former units per area instead of colony former units per mass. And that comes, the per mass unit comes from our work with, well, our allergy community work with aeroallergens, where we measure mold spores in colony forming units per gram. And we can do that effectively because we have standards and we have controls. But in the case, in this case, we wanted to find the total burden of the contamination. And so the units were, I think, one of the issues that was also brought up in the GAO report. Mm -hmm. Agreed. The, the final question that I asked Colonel Henschel the, the last time, and, and, and he's answered, I, I really do want to ask the rest of you, given what we know now, and it is hindsight, I, I make no, uh, and I make no apologies for saying it with, with hindsight, do we believe that given the potential risk to the workers every day, and you know, they worked every single day, the plant was never closed down, never closed down. Should we have been prudent? Ask the GAO this and you, Dr. Hamilton. Should we have closed the plant down and did what we had to do? We closed federal government buildings down to protect members of Congress. To protect, and it would just, let me a, let you answer the question. Should we have closed this facility down while we were checking? Uh, I don't know that I'm in a position to answer that question. I, all I can say is based on the information we were provided, which was by uh, the Centers for Disease Control and the Connecticut Department of Public Health, they identified a number of reasons why they felt uh, it didn't need to be closed down. We're, I'm certainly not in a position to evaluate that, but there were certainly uh, a number of reasons that they did provide, which we do have in the report. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rhodes. Absent understanding the lethal dose question, and that's really at the heart of your, of your question. You're saying, were people exposed to a lethal dose? 
And as you've heard from Colonel Henschel and as you've heard in the discussion, nobody can come up and give you that answer right now. So we aren't, we, the GAO, aren't in the position to make that statement, but we can say that those are the two items, those are the two factors that need to be brought in. What is a lethal dose? And it can't be geared just toward what's called the LD50, the lethal dose for 50% of the exposed population. Because now that we have the, the outlier, as it were, the, the woman in Connecticut uh, who's dead from inhalation anthrax, that proves that the lethal dose for 1% is real. And those things need to be factored in to the decision you're, you're the, the discussion you're having. Dr. Hen. <laughs> well, given that one of the, I, I, I agree with Dr. Rhodes, we, we have that sentimental question that needs to be addressed. But given the fact that the results were withheld because of a conclusion that the methods were not validated or not validatable at that point, I think the conservative thing would have been to close the facility and to, to test it with other methods, bringing in consensus consensus from other governmental agencies that had different approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me uh, take my time and begin. Dr. Hamilton, you have sampling equipment. I'd like you to, is that correct? You brought some sampling. We have, we have an example of uh, the various methods of sampling. Right. Why don't we do that? And why don't you, as you describe it, talk about its benefits and limitations? I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Barry Skolnick, who um, was seminal in getting this information. Uh, many of the, the items came from NIOSH, right. and uh, the, the vacuum sampling device came from, um, from us as well. You're going to need a mic right there. Okay. Mr. Day was kind enough to uh, give me his chair. Do I have one? Yes, uh, my name is Barry Skolnick, a colleague of Dr. Hamilton. I appreciate You're going to have you talk a little louder because yes. that mic is not cooperating. It's not going to cooperate. Yes, my name is Barry Skolnick. I'm an associate of Dr. Hamilton's at Johns Hopkins. And um, I thank you for this opportunity. Would you do me a favor? Just tap that mic. Just give me. Is it, yeah, okay, it's on. It's just. It's on. Uh, okay, I'll we, just have to speak yeah. a little. Okay. Yes. Um, we came with some courtesy of uh, the folks at uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and uh, some others I'll mention, we have a few examples to put some physical realities to some of these ideas. Uh, we have examples of the swab, a wipe, and the HEPA vacuuming device, that, okay. uh, the kind that were used, and we can say a few things about them. Uh, this is a swab. You're all familiar with these so-called Q-tip type of thing. And uh, what's important to say about this, it's like your toothbrush. How many different ways are there to use a toothbrush? Uh, there's a lot. How many ways that are effective? Probably many fewer. And one of the issues in our concerns in looking into this matter is the general vagueness of some procedures as to how to use it. So you have to keep in mind that we talk about a device, there's not a unitary definition of what that means. It's a matter of a system of what materials are used, different commercial items, the method by which they're used, and the method by which they're extracted and analyzed in the laboratory. So what you're seeing now is only part of the story and is not necessarily the best or optimal way of doing it. But this is a swab which was intended to use small, uh, to, to sample small areas. I think it's instructive to point out that both CDC and the Postal Service called for about a 100 centimeter squared coverage area, about four by four inches. There's at least two other procedures we know of, one by the National, uh, by the, uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration as part of their planetary protection program. It's about 25 years old that calls for a quarter of that area, two by two inches, for sampling. There's a European procedure that was just validated in 1997 that calls for a fifth of that area, 20 square centimeters. As far as we know, no one has looked at this to see whether you can cover 100 square centimeters with a swab with any thoroughness or reproducibility. And it's the kind of question that needs asking that is why a peer review and a organized process is needed. But uh, uh, I would also say that going back to NASA again, which we understand is an agency under your jurisdiction, they have a very impressive record over 30 years in this planetary quarantine, planetary protection process of using swabs to look at the surface of spacecraft and achieving very high sensitivity down on the order of 300 spores per square meter. It's a number, which is their contractual standard and they've published on this. With swabs, they're able to do this on the clean surfaces of spacecraft. So it is not necessarily true that a swab is inferior 
It just may be that the procedures that have been used recently are not really validated for the purpose to which they've been used. But that's a swab. Um, just and the advantage of it being wet versus dry? Well, <laughs> we can say, I think, categorically that we've found, we've gone back to the literature back to 1917 when the swab rinse assay was first in the literature, swab being the device and rinse being the wet extraction technique for environmental sampling. We found nothing in the entire literature that we've looked at that justifies use of a dry swab for this purpose. In your doctor's office, the dry swab is used to take a throat specimen or you use it to pick up moist tissue samples, moist fluid samples. If the surface were moist, you'd use a dry swab. But to look at dry surfaces, there's simply nothing we've seen that represents a prior history that would justify its use. And the, the literature that's come out since suggests that it's not very effective. So uh, uh, I think clearly a wet swab would be better. But there's different ways of doing a wet swab. And we don't want to go into all these details. We've indicated some that we think need looking into. We don't necessarily have all the answers. But it's clear that, that uh, wet is better than dry, not only in principle and in literature, but also in performance, as indicated at Wallingford and at Brentwood and some other places. The other thing I should say about this swab, poor little swab, imagine you are in one of these personal protective equipment ensembles, spacesuit, moon suit, with thick gloves and then a second layer of gloves. And you have to open the package that this swab is in in a sterile fashion so you don't cross-contaminate it. One of the issues that involves interoperability and basically the practical issues of using these devices is considering the entire range of context in which you're using them. And I'm not saying that they use them in just this way, but, but it's part of a, of a total systems problem, not only to have a device, but to consider the ways in which you use it uh, in the entire process. They're most practicable, and they can be made uniform. If you have 20 different teams in 20 different places doing this, how do you know that they're doing it in a similar fashion according to some quality assurance and have trained in a proficient manner? These are issues I need addressing. The, uh, the next one is, uh, is the wipe, and this has some interesting related matters. This is, a, this is gauze of the kind that you're familiar with that was sent to us by NIOSH, illustrating the three by three it would be wiped and then folded and wiped again. What's interesting about this to us, and we have no expertise in this directly ourselves, but again, we've looked at literature. NASA has had a wipe rinse procedure since approximately 1980 that has been standardized and practiced. They don't use a wipe like this. They use a wipe that is 10 by 10 inches, not 3 by 3 or less, in a certain way and you know, in a certain manner. And the question that arises for us is why are these wipes being used instead of the other? Undoubtedly, these could be handled in less fluid and maybe more inexpensively, but we don't know what the basis is of using this small wipe. And I would also point out that the original wet wipes that were used at Brentwood gave very poor result. And uh, they were cotton, these are non-cotton, so that there's some questions here. But I'm pointing out again, uh, with a pitch again, National Aeronautics and Space Administration has a history of relevant technology. That, that agency has not been part of the bioterrorism or the terrorism response <coughs> activities of the federal government that I'm aware of. And maybe that's something you could look into in a concrete form. The third, the third uh, uh, and of course these are always used wet. I don't think there's been any issue about that. Um, the third procedure is what's called a HEPA vacuum. This vacuum thing. And it has, well, I don't want you to talk unless you're talking the mic. So you're going to have to, we have to transcribe. I don't have to. We have. Yes, I understand. Excuse me. <laughs> In fact, the only one I know who is working here today is a transcriber. <laughs> right. My apologies. The third type of, uh, of assay device is called a HEPA vacuum cleaner. HEPA means high efficiency particulate air. And if you looked into this thing, you would see a lot of folded paper material, which is very good at trapping small particles and has a high capacity. That's a HEPA filter. We actually have a double filtering process here. This is provided, this is recommended by NIOSH. They've been using this for some years now. It's uh, happening maybe by Atrix Corporation. Uh, it, it's been used in, in uh, remediation for asbestos and other environmental particulates for a considerable period of time. You trap the small things in here so they don't get out of the environment from your vacuum. But the filter they're talking about is a different device put in a different place. This is, uh, as Dr. Hamilton showed you, it's been called a nozzle sock, the dust collection trap. It's been in use for about 10 years in the Hopkins laboratory. It's inserted at the end of the hose, something like this, uh, so that 
this little filter will trap the small part particles off the surfaces that you're trying to collect from. And this is the kind of setup, the kind of arrangement that was used being held down by hand against surfaces to collect the HEPAVAC samples, including the famous ones of the three million spores at, at, uh, at Wallingford and so forth. So it has a certain advantage of having a larger or smaller area of coverage, much more than the other. But it's got some issues too, particularly the validation of its procedures is, uh, is yet to be done. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Before um, um, I go to Mr. Kucinich, I, I would like to um, uh, ask uh, Dr. Melling if you would, uh, you, you stood up, didn't you, Dr. Melling, and you were sworn in, correct? Dr. Melling used to um, be the director of Port and Down in uh, Great Britain. And I'm interested to have you tell us how you're a U.S. citizen now. You aren't. A, a permanent resident, sir. Okay, permanent resident. It's good enough for me. Um, how would uh, Great Britain have dealt with this issue? Um, well, what I say is clearly somewhat speculative because yep. they were never faced with it. But we had two incidents. Uh, we had an island that was contaminated in 1942-43 as a result of joint US-British uh, biological warfare experimentation. And that island was closed to the public and any visitors for 40 some years um, until it had been decontaminated and until post-decontamination samples were proved negative and until uh, sheep had been let loose on the island. I think it was for two consecutive summers and all the sheep survived. At that point, people were sufficiently confident that the island was safe, that it was then returned to its original owners. Uh, the cost of that was several million dollars. So, so, so it was thought worth spending that money to decontaminate. The second incident was, I think it was the late 1980s at King's Cross Station in London was un undergoing refurbishment and um, uh, the original station roofing area had been insulated with horsehair. Uh, this must have been in the 1800s. Uh, that horsehair turned out to be contaminated with anthrax. Um, the uh, appropriate areas in the, in the, in the facility, in the station were um, sealed off um, and the horsehair was removed. Um, there was uh, decontamination carried out. And again, post that procedure, uh, confirmation that no anthrax could, have been, could be found. Um, so I think, and my own opinion is that um, I agree with Colonel Henschel uh, in his written statement that in the absence of detail and a good scientific knowledge, uh, prudence is the sensible course. And I agree with Dr. Hamilton um, that a key issue is to have well-validated test procedures. And in the absence of well-validated test procedures, uh, we, again, we don't know enough to make sensible uh, judgments. Um, and if I, in a, a concluding remark in terms of quantitation, there was a British scientist, Lord Kelvin, uh, who said, if you can't put numbers on it, it's not science. Thank you very much. Um, you, you may stay there. Um, thank you, Mr. Kucinich, for your patience. Good to have you here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to say that when we're looking at trying to uh, protect uh, those who work for our government and the general public, from any kind of a biological attack. I think it's instructive to do what we're doing here, which is to, uh, is to look at how systems can, can be and have been improved to uh, provide detection and, uh, and protection. I also think, though, that we're, we're only really at half measures here. Uh, and, and this is by no means a criticism of our distinguished chair, who I have the greatest respect for. Because um, to talk about, as we are today, uh, prevention without talking about the events of 2001 
is to really miss an opportunity to reflect upon where that anthrax came from. Now, Colonel, uh, you're from Fort Detrick, Maryland, is that correct? Yes, I'm the commander of the USAMRD. Prior to uh, September of 2001, did you ever have any discussions with, uh, uh, with um, uh, officers in charge of biological uh, agents at Fort Detrick, Maryland, where they work on research and development of such agents? Did you ever have any discussions of the custody of any biological uh, weapons agents over at Fort Detrick? Uh, in the event those agents ever came uh, out of a laboratory there? The issue of biosurity was one that, and, and even as a principle, was one that only evolved after the events of 2001. Uh, through its 34-year history, USAMRD was principally uh, an academic scientist. Could you speak a little louder, please? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, until the events of 2001, the, the, the idea of surety as an issue for biological agents didn't exist. It only evolved after the events of, a, of uh, that terrible October. Uh, during, through its 34-year history, USAMRD was principally an academic scientific institution, and the, the standards that we used were the same as were being used at the CDC or were being used at the National Institutes of Health. Um, we never thought and had tremendous confidence in our scientists. Agents from our laboratory would, would be taken or would be released in, a, in, a, in some nefarious way. So, so there was, uh, as you say, there was never any discussion about what would happen if any of those agents were ever, uh, from that laboratory, were ever released. Well, we, throughout our history, we, we did have systems to protect the workforce and to protect the Fort Teacher community in Frederick. We have uh, extensive and have always had extensive security, uh, extensive restrictions on how to get to our laboratories. Uh, the issue for us had always been safety as the number one concern. Um, uh, and that's pretty much how we were designed. Uh, was, was based on safety, but not necessarily surety, which is really a different set of guidelines. Um, we actually continued to have terrific records on the agents that we were using um, and uh, were in compliance with the new rules about how to ship the agents uh, that were put in place in, in the late 90s. And, and uh, when you speak of surety, tell me immediately after the incident of the release of the anthrax. Uh, did you have any discussions with any of your associates at Fort Detrick uh, relative to the fact that the anthrax uh, may have come from a government laboratory at Fort Detrick, Maryland? No, we really didn't. Um, it, it was That was so far out of our mind that the people that were working and had dedicated their lives to biological defense would be involved in this event. Um, we were concentrating on responding to the national need and actually it was actually a complete surprise to us come December and January when those suspicions started to be raised. And do you know now, do you know now that uh, whether or not Fort Detrick was the source of uh, a strain of anthrax that ended up uh, in circulation? There, there's no question that the strain, the AIM strain, was isolated at Fort Detrick. But that does not necessarily implicate the institution or the scientists that worked there in making the materials that actually ended up in the threat letters. What does that mean, then? It means that it, it, the, many people had access to the actual strain. These are replicating agents. And uh, this was a particular strain that was under study in many different laboratories, not only in ours, but also at the CDC, uh, in, in academia, all had access to the strain eventually in the, by the late 90s. Um, we had shared the strain with our colleagues at Port and Down even. Um, uh, the, but because these are replicating agents, someone can take those materials and use them in a way that USAMR would be, would be completely unaware of. Uh, 
this is not something that has defined quantity that you can follow and know exactly how many organisms are there all the time. These are replicating agents. And so while we originally made the isolation of the strain, any other trained microbiologist and a few others would have been able to take that material and replicate it and use it in the way that we all uh, had to respond to. So once you've isolated the strain of the of the, the AIM strain of uh, anthrax as being uh, one of as being the strain that was uh, present mm -hmm. at Fort Dittrick, uh, what efforts were made? What scientific efforts were made to be able to uh, de to be able to uh, determine uh, what other possibilities are that that strain could have come from someplace other than Fort Dittrick? Well, that is, that is in the hands of the FBI. Almost immediately from the events of October, the FBI has been at USAMRIN and trying to make that determination. Uh, they re actually relied on a lot of the shipping records that we had back to the 1980s that where we could pinpoint locations where the strain had been shared. Um, it's important to remember that USAMR did not have the capability and does not currently make living preparations of dried spores. And so that, that particular capability didn't exist at USAMR. Are, are you prepared to uh, say that there's no way that that anthrax could have come from Fort Detrick, Maryland, the anthrax that was in circulation? I, I have uh, significant doubt that it came from USAMR, primarily because we don't have ma many, much of the equipment necessary to really make uh, dried spores, viable dried spores in that, in that way. Have there been any personnel changes over there since uh, uh, October of 2001 with respect to people who had custody of those uh, agents? Uh, I'm not aware of any particular turnover. We have personnel turnover all the time, of course. But not particularly anyone who had custody of those agents. There's no turnover. No, sir. No, sir. And since the events of 2001, what kind of security procedures have you put in place with respect to the custody of, of not only anthrax, of any other biological agents that are present at uh, Fort Detrick? Well, I, I appreciate that question, and, and, and especially within the last year, I can say that USAMRD has increased not only the physical, physical security of the agent, but also its safety program. We have a, quite a comprehensive program now. We're in, we're, we were in compliance with DOD regulations within 90 days after I took command, and we are approaching compliance with all the requirements of 42 CFR Part 73 that specify additional measures to be taken under the federal biosurity program. What role do you see for the Center for Disease Control in terms of helping to coordinate programs that relate to um, the, um, um, an outbreak of a biological agent well, in the general population? Uh, I believe they continue to be a f an important agency and a focus for efforts to um, respond to the public health threat represented by these agents. Do you think their position should be subordinate to Homeland Security or should it be a coordinate position? Uh, that's not my decision. Uh, but there certainly needs to be a way to um, coordinate all of the interagency uh, activities that are going on. I uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say that uh, I, I think this is a, a very useful discussion uh, that uh, this committee is having today. I also think it would be useful for the American public to and for this Congress, which, uh, as we know, had its uh, uh, conduct dramatically changed during those days. For us to uh, once again revisit this question of the origins of the anthrax, the nature of the anthrax attacks, uh, the American people still don't know. And I think the people have a right to know, and I think that this is the committee to do it, and I would just uh, appeal to the Chair's uh, uh, thoughtfulness and consideration of this. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Um, we're going to get on with our next panel, but I, before you get up, is there anything that any of you need to put on the record? Um, Dr. Mellon, Mr. Unger, Mr. Dr. Rose, Dr. Hamilton, Colonel, anything that you need to put on the record that uh, we will be happy as part of the record? All done? Thank you all very much. Um, uh, then our next panel will be, and uh, I, we, we're, we're going to have our witnesses. Let me just tell you, our two witnesses that are going to be uh, up here on the dais with us will be Dr. James Hadley, 
and um, Mr. Davis Lane. Uh, they'll be up where Dr. Melling was. Um, and um, because we only have so many seats up front, we can work it this way, I think. Mr. Thomas Day, uh, Vice President of Engineering, United States Postal Service. Mr. William Burris, President, American Postal Workers Union. Captain Kenneth Martinez, Engineer Center for Disease Control, accompanied by Dr. Bradley Perkins. We'll have them sit up front, and then we'll have Dr. James L. Hadley, State Epidemiologist, uh, State of Connecticut Department of Public Health, and Mr. R. Davis Lane, Deputy Assistant Secretary, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. I think it can work this way. <coughs> So it's Day, Burris, Martinez, Hadley. Oh, excuse me. No, no, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Perkins and Dr. Had Hadler and Mr. Lane will be up there. <coughs> Does this work? Perkins, do you want to be uh, next to Captain Martinez? Yeah, why don't you why don't you do that? I'm sorry, that that'll make sense. We're going to put that chair back, and we'll put you uh, um, next to Dr. Hen. Thank you for your patience here, everyone. You might stay standing because we're going to swear you all in if you'd stand. Even if you were sworn in the first time. <laughs> Thank you. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. No, for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. We thank you very much for being here. We thank you for your patience. I think that you've heard some of the questions that have already been asked, the statements, so you may want to incorporate it in your statements. We're looking for five-minute statements. You can run over, but not too much longer than that. And the clock will go five minutes. It'll show red, and then we'll tip it over again for the other five minutes. But again, if you try to stay as close to the original five, that would be helpful. Um, and we'll start uh, with you, Mr. Day, uh, and then to, to Mr. Burris, and then Captain Martinez, and then we will go to Dr. Hadler and uh, Mr. Lane. All right? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee. My name is Thomas Day, and I'm the Vice President of Engineering for the United States Postal Service. Generally, my job involves the development of internal processes, policies, and equipment that make the Postal Service move the, mail, the nation's mail more efficiently, effectively, and as quickly as possible. However, over the last year and a half, a major part of my duties has been responding to the anthrax attacks of 2001 and improving our system defenses to minimize the effects of any future attacks. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today about the Postal Service's progress in addressing this unforeseen situation. Tragically, the mail was the vehicle for a bar terrorist attack on our nation. It required a massive and coordinated response by the Postal Service, a response that was successful only with the help and support of so many others from all levels of government and the private sector. Unfortunately for all of us, information available at the time was simply inadequate to serve as a reliable roadmap through uncharted territory. But we must recognize that while the nation's mail system was selected to deliver anthrax in 2001, there are many other agents that can be delivered in many other ways. Bioterrorism is not just a Postal Service issue. Considering my experience over the last year and a half, if there's to be a theme to my remarks, it would be lessons learned. After the anthrax attacks of October 2001, our primary goal then, as now, was protecting the safety of our employees and our customers. 
At the national level, we saw the need to test and monitor our major mail processing facilities to detect potential employee exposure and limit the possibility of cross-contamination. We work quickly to test more than 100 of these facilities. While the anthrax crisis affected the Postal Service in many locations throughout the nation, I will focus on the three phases of the situation in Connecticut. The first phase began in October of 2001 in response to the potential presence of anthrax throughout the Postal Service network. As was happening throughout the nation, the Connecticut District Manager activated a crisis command center. Activities included an employee safeguard program to provide clear, consistent, and accurate communications to employees through a single, reliable channel, including employee town hall meetings to discuss facility testing. There were also daily communication links with union and management association leadership, which provided a feedback channel for employee and union concerns. Initially, it did not appear there were any problems in Connecticut. By late November, however, we learned that a Connecticut resident was thought to have inhalational anthrax. Mail was suspected as the possible cause. This was the beginning of phase two of our experience. Mail received at the victim's home in Oxford would have passed through our Southern Connecticut Processing and Distribution Center in Wallingford. We immediately began testing at the Wallingford facility and informing employees of the situation and providing them antibiotics. When testing found anthrax contamination on four pieces of automated mail sorting equipment, these machines were immediately taken out of service, the areas isolated and cordoned off. The report triggered a coordinated multi-agency response that included additional testing, decontamination, continued medical prophylactics of employees, and extensive employee communication activities. Employee unions were briefed on the sampling results and decontamination plans, the plant manager, the medical officer, and union officials held town meetings with employees to discuss the results. The Connecticut Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency worked directly with Postal Service Headquarters Incident Command Center and the Connecticut Crisis Command Center to formulate the decontamination strategy for the equipment. Throughout the decontamination process, we were advised there was no additional health risk to our employees. Let me touch on the issue of sampling for a moment because it was and remains a complex and evolving process. Postal Service contractors had used a dry swab sampling because this technique was recommended by the nation's public health laboratories. These laboratories were performing the analysis and felt this was the best sample collection means available to maximize laboratory resources. In subsequent rounds of tests conducted by the CDC at Wallingford, they used a number of sampling protocols, including wet wipes and a newly developed HEPA filter vacuum process. At the time, there was no single standard for testing. Today, the value of these new sampling methods is widely recognized and is a part of our sampling protocol. The third phase of the anthrax situation began in February of 2002 when union leaders at the processing center requested a general cleanup that would include the High Bay area. Local management acted prudently and decided first to conduct testing of the High Bay Area. Their concern was that without testing the presence of anthrax, cleaning could dislodge anthrax spores that might be present. Working with public health and environmental agencies, consensus testing protocols were developed and a High Bay sampling con was conducted, an operation that was conducted during a, uh, a point where we reduced operations to 12 hours that day. After learning that the tests were positive for the presence of anthrax, both CDC and the Connecticut DPH indicated that no medical intervention was necessary because of the length of time since the suspected cross-contaminated letter passed through the facility and the fact that no employee had become ill. Like so much that occurred during the anthrax crisis, actual decontamination of the high bay had no precedent. The process was uniquely shaped by the interagency guidance of OSHA, CDC, EPA and the Connecticut DPH. <clears throat> we recognize that questions have raised about the Postal Service's decision in connection with the events at the Wallingford facility. We believe that the GAO has provided the proper context by describing them as understandable given the challenging circumstances at the time, the advice received from public health officials, an ongoing criminal investigation, and the uncertainties about sampling methods. There are always opportunities for improvement in our future communications efforts. <coughs> Excuse me. 
regarding anthrax or other biohazards. I assure you that our focus will remain on providing complete and accurate information to our employees as promptly as possible regarding any situation that may affect their health and safety. We also believe that explanation of any test result should continue to be handled in conjunction with the appropriate local health care experts. Subcommittee asked that I specifically address the terms validated and confirmed as they appeared in our anthrax guidelines. Validation involved three distinct activities in connection with our sampling activities. First, verification the samples were taken. Second, logging the samples under a chain of custody procedure. And finally, verification the samples were taken according to established laboratory protocols, including adherence to quality assurance and quality control. A confirmed sample was a cultured sample for which a rece we received a final written report from the laboratory that the sample, based on quality assurance and quality control determinations, was either positive or negative for the presence of Bacillus anthracis. We recognize these terms have resulted in some confusion, and as a result, they will be eliminated in this context. However, we will remain robust quality assurance and quality control procedures to ensure that we have the same level of accuracy and reliability for all future sampling and testing. The Postal Service must also consider what lessons learned could mean for the future. This is addressed in our Comprehensive Emergency Preparedness Plan that was submitted to Congress on March 6, 2002 and was updated this past month. There are four basic strategies in the plan, detection, containment, neutralization, and deterrence. Since June of 2002, we've been testing biodetection and filtration equipment for use at our automated mail processing centers. We have carefully reviewed the results, results and are now confident that our biohazard detection system is working successfully. We have also evaluated a ventilation filtration system at a number of our processing centers. This provides the opportunity to contain potential biohazards in the mail as it moves through a processing operation. There is one other issue I'd like to raise, indemnification. While working with the Department of Homeland Security on this issue, the indemnification of contractors has been a, signif a significant obstacle in the cleanup of the Washington and Trenton facilities, as well as the purchase of the biohazard detection equipment. Some potential suppliers have been unwilling to offer essential products and services unless they have, are indemnified against claims arising out of acts of terrorism. As I mentioned earlier, the anthrax attacks of 2001 happened to the United States Postal Service as the vehicle of the attack. But there is no reason to believe that another bioterrorist would choose the same delivery vehicle or the same biohazard. Bioterrorism is not just a Postal Service issue. It is one that requires a strong and coordinated national response. Perhaps the most valuable lesson I've learned through my experience with this issue is that deterrence is infinitely preferable to reacting <clears throat> after a system has been breached. No one, certainly not our employees or our customers, should be forced to pay so high a price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Burris. Good afternoon. I want to thank Subcommittee Chairman Christopher Shays, Ranking Member, and Dennis Kucinich, and all the committee members for the opportunity to address this most important issue. I am accompanied today by John Derzius, the President of the Greater Connecticut Area Local, representing over 100 offices in Central Connecticut, including the Wallingford facility. My testimony today will concentrate on the events and issues surrounding the anthrax contamination of the Southern Connecticut Mail Processing and Distribution Center, located in Wallingford. When the anthrax crisis arose in October 2001, the terrorist attacks of September the 11th were still vivid in our minds, and the national psyche was wounded. The mail had been used to transmit deadly anthrax, and two Brentwood postal workers were victims in late October. Other postal workers from Brentwood and Hamilton Township, New Jersey, were hospitalized with life-threatening infections. Thousands of workers were prescribed medication as a precaution. Postal workers were especially concerned, but despite their fears, continued to work serving our nation with courage and dignity. At the outset of the anthrax crisis, the Postal Service and the Postal Unions embarked on a cooperative effort to cope with the crisis, evaluate progress, and facilitate communications at the national level. 
Members of the task force met almost daily, exchanging information and discussing options. And through most of this crisis, the course of action worked quite well. Unfortunately, the same level of cooperation did not exist at the local level in every instance. It certainly did not exist in Connecticut. Shortly after the Brentwood deaths, the Wallingford facility, along with more than 250 other postal facilities, were tested for anthrax contamination using the swab sample sampling method. The results were negative as the majority of facilities tested nationwide, including in Wallingford. But when Mrs. Lundgren, a 94-year-old widow who lived in nearby Oxford, died of ventilation anthrax, contaminated mail was suspected. Fear gripped postal workers and nearby residents. Three rounds of additional tests were conducted using variations of the swab method, and each produced a negative result. And finally, when the more sophisticated ATPA vacuum sampling was utilized, anthrax was detected. The presence of anthrax was described as being in trace amounts. The situation at the Wallingford facility was reported at the national task force meetings, but the exchange of information, as we have subsequently learned, was incomplete. The quantitative results were not presented to the task force members. The failure by the Postal Service and state health department officials to provide important information was revealed in early January 2002, when a local APW representative was verbally informed by a CDC official that contamination was significantly higher than had been reported to the union and to the employees. This was later confirmed in an email the union obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request made in April 2002 received in 2003. The December 2001 email from the CDC official Larry Cash, Shesh says, this is to discuss the findings of my samples from Wallingford P&D that is the highest ever collected at post offices. There has been considerably, considerable disagreement regarding the level of contamination in the Connecticut facility. Test results put the number of spores found at approximately 3 million. While the significance of this figure has been hotly debated, clearly there was more than trace contamination, and without question, there was sufficient contamination to cause death. This raises a troubling question. When do authorities have a duty to inform employees of threats to their safety and health? The evidence is clear that discussions were held among various agencies, including the Postal Service, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Connecticut Department of Health regarding who would assume responsibility for notifying employees. A GAO report issued in April 2003 went to great lengths to analyze documents that set forth the responsibilities of the agencies involved. The report notes that the Postal Service requested and the investigation team agreed that the Postal Service would be the sole party responsible for communicating test results and other information to the workers at the facility. Yet the Postal Service failed to notify the employees and the union of the quantitative sample results. This failure to report the results was compounded by the failure to properly respond to a January 2002 request from the local union president for documents detailing exposure. When it became clear that repeated union requests for exposure data was not being honored, the union petitioned OSHA to enforce the standard that requires employers to provide such data within 15 days of request. OSHA failed to enforce its standard. It declined to issue a citation to the Post Service, and the requested information was not provided for a period of for full nine months at the initial, after the initial union request. The record, of course, also shows that while the requests were being made and denied, the Postal Service knew the results. CDC knew the results. And the Connecticut Department of Health knew the results. Those most directly concerned, the employees, did not know. Employees were not informed despite repeated requests for information by the local union. Yet the GAO concludes that given the circumstances, the failure to report the results is understandable. We vehemently disagree. OSHA's failure to uphold its standard to protect workers and the Postal Service continued refusal to provide anthrax exposure data is simply inexcusable. 
Nowhere in the Code of Federal Regulation for OSHA is there an exception. No matter how one interprets the regulations, employees were denied the fundamental right to make informed decisions regarding their safety and health. It is abundantly clear that postal workers at the Wallingford facility were denied the right to protect themselves from dangers in the workplace. We, are, we feel it is far too easy to say we learned our lesson. It will not happen again. Postal employees worked in the facility that tested positive for anthrax, a toxin presumed by the medical community to be capable of causing death, even, it, even when present in only minute amounts. Medical treatment that was offered as protection was provided under false pretenses. Postal workers are wary, and they should be. No one has been held accountable, and this failure is, in GAO's interpretation, understandable. And let me say a word about the, uh, the present effort to provide detection equipment. This equipment will go on specified postal equipment, not all of the equipment. The 600 million pieces of mail that the post service handles daily does not go directly from the collection box or from the customer to the letter carrier. It is commingled in postal facilities throughout this country. Over 50% of that mail bypasses the Postal Service system and goes directly to the carrier delivery station. It would be possible there are over 200 private consolidation plants in existence in this country processing Americans' mail. They hire low-wage workers without background checks. It's very possible for terrorists to be hired by one of these companies. That mail would never come through a postal facility that has biodetection equipment. It would go directly to the letter carrier, to the bag, to the customer, to the American citizens. Let me also discuss for a moment a pattern of failure. We begin with the swab versus the AGPA system of testing. We go to the word, the use of the word trace contamination. Despite the union's two decade old effort to have the, the stoppage of the use of compressed air, of blowing postal equipment, we go from the use of compressed air to the vacuum system of cleaning postal equipment. We embarked on the dispensation of CIPRO as a means of protecting employees without a comprehensive study of the long term effect on individuals who were not suffering any illness. And to date, there is no medical documentation of the long-term effect of the thousands of postal employees and other federal workers as well who took Cipro for extended periods of time. And many employees rejected the use of Cipro because they were informed by their employer, notably the United States Post Service, that there were trace amounts. So employees were endangered unnecessarily because they receive misleading information. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I respectively submit that the events surrounding the Wallerford anthrax con contamination are not understandable, not to me and not to the workers I represent. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before your committee. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Burris. Let me just say to uh, to you, the members here, uh, Ms. Delora, myself, Ms. Janklo, they're, they're not understood by us as well. And um, we see no excuse for what you had to encounter, what your um, workers had to encounter, your members. Uh, Captain Martinez. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am Captain Kenneth Martinez, a supervisory industrial hygienist with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. With me is Dr. Bradley Perkins, Acting Associate Director for Bioterrorism in the Division of Bacterial and Mycotic Diseases at CDC's National Center for Infectious Diseases. On behalf of CDC and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, I am pleased to describe our role in anthrax detection and remediation in the fall of 2001, and particularly CDC's work at the Wallingford, Connecticut Postal Facility. I would note, although both Dr. Perkins and I have knowledge and expertise in the subject of this hearing, we were not specifically assigned to the Wallingford investigation. 
An important part of CDC's role during the anthrax attacks of 2001 was an environmental testing of facilities potentially contaminated with anthrax. We performed this work at the request of the state or local health department. CDC sample collection experts and microbiological analysis experts worked in consultation with experts from the military and elsewhere. Environmental sampling was useful in several ways. It helped to identify the likely source of the infection. It helped us to understand environmental exposure pathways and the potential for settled anthrax spores to become airborne again. And it helped guide decisions about cleaning and reoccupancy. Before the anthrax events of the fall of 2001, standard procedures for environmental sampling for Bacillus anthracis did not exist. At the beginning, we identified existing sampling methods that could be used or adapted such as the allergy sock method used for sampling allergen exposures. This became a new sampling technique known as HEPA vacuum sampling, which proved a useful tool to sample for anthrax exposures over large surface areas and complex machine surfaces. Our investigation proceeded. As our investigation proceeded, we continually refined and improved our methods and procedures based on our accumulating experience. Once our primary mission response was complete, CDC worked in partnership with the U.S. Postal Service and USPS contractors at various affected postal facility sites to conduct comparative studies to evaluate the strengths and the limitations of various sample collection analysis techniques. CDC does not yet know the minimum concentration of anthrax spores that can be detected through existing methods. In an effort to further improve our sampling and analytical ability, CDC has research underway with the Army's Dugway Proving Grounds to clarify sensitivity and analytical methods for Bacillus anthracis and other biologic agents. In interpreting the results of environmental sampling, there are many factors that, we need, that need to be taken into account. One factor is the purpose of the sampling, whether, for instance, it is for screening, for targeting, characterization, or verification. Another consideration is that different sampling methods, whether swabs, wipes, or HEPA vacuum, may be best for different types of applications. And a combination of these methods is often needed. The first samples collected in the anthrax investigation were only determined to be positive or negative. Later, it became possible to roughly quantify results, but such findings still had limitations in their accuracy. Finally, although the level of anthrax spores in the air is finding is the finding most relevant to risk, it is very difficult to find positive air samples once a facility is closed and ventilation has been turned off. Therefore, surface sampling was most heavily relied upon during the anthrax investigation. Two patterns of sampling results were the most indicative of possible aerosolization. Contamination of surfaces such as air ducts and rafters and the dispersion pattern of multiple positive samples. At the same time, it is important to note that surface sampling points to evidence of contamination, but not necessarily evidence of exposure or risk. Engineering information or work practice information are both important in understanding the potential for human exposure. Whether, for instance, a particular machine surface has likely potential for worker contact and whether compressed air is used for cleaning. After inhalation was diagnosed in a 94-year-old woman from Oxford, Connecticut, the CDC deployed an investigative team at the request of the Connecticut Department of Health. The investigation focused on mail as the source of the anthrax and efforts were undertaken to detect Bacillus anthracis at the Wallingford Postal Facility. On November 25, 2001, CDC investigators collected environmental samples at the Wallingford facility using wet swabs and all samples which were analyzed by the Connecticut Department of Health were found negative. Two earlier rounds of dry swab sampling conducted by the USPS had also found negative results. Although those earlier results were negative, post-exposure prophylaxis was recommended for Wallingford Postal employees, and over 9,000 of the 1,122 workers were given antibiotics. On November 28, CDC conducted targeted sampling, including the use of wet wipe and HEPA vacuum sampling on a machine used primarily to process bulk mail because 80% of the mail received by the, at the patient's home was bulk mail. Positive Bacillus anthracis cultures were confirmed from four barcode sorting machines on this fourth round of sampling, and the affected machines were taken out of service. 
A fifth round of sampling was done on December 2nd, also by CDC, to examine the extent of contamination on the machines, and the results confirmed extensive contamination for machine number 10. As results of these sampling two rounds were finalized by the laboratory, they were reported directly to the Connecticut Department of Health and shared with CDC and USPS so that public health steps, isolation of the affected equipment, town hall meetings, and extension of antibiotic treatment for workers to 60 days could be immediately taken. The actions to protect the workers were the same regardless of whether the reported results were qualitative or quantitative. Following the assessment component of the investigation, CDC provided technical assistance to the USPS on appropriate methods for decontaminating the machines and verifying the efficacy of cleanup. All samples were found to be negative and the machines were returned to service. Similar assistance was provided in April 2002 when positive results were found in the high bay areas of the facility. The CDC investigation was instrumental in demonstrating a possible source for the infection in the case of inhalational anthrax in Connecticut. Our investigation showed that extensive sampling was needed and epidemiological investigation essential in identifying sites for sampling. None of the dry or wet swabs was positive, but positive results were obtained through wet wipes and HEPA vacuuming. Therefore, for future investigation of large facilities, we recommend that these two methods be included. As mentioned, CDC has research underway with the Army to clarify the sensitivity of sampling and analysis methods for Bacillus anthracis, as well as for other biological agents. As we update our guidelines for anthrax response in the future investigation and in the event that future investigations are needed, we will consider the lesson learned, lessons learned from Wallingford and the findings of our continuing research to assure that the most effective sampling is conducted and that the findings and interpretations of findings are properly communicated to all infected parties. <coughs> Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Captain Martinez. Um, we'll now go to uh, Dr. Hadler. I should speak into the silver microphone, is that yes, right? Yes, that's okay. correct. Thank okay. you. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman good and afternoon. members of the uh, subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to describe the investigation of inhalation anthrax case in Connecticut, the subsequent identification of anthrax in the Wallingford Postal Facility, uh, and lessons learned as they relate to sampling. I've been director of the Infectious Diseases Division and state epidemiologist at the Connecticut Department of Public Health for the past uh, 19 years. I'm a physician trained in internal medicine, infectious disease, public health. Need you uh, to talk a little louder. Uh, uh, public you know, health you, and, and you don't have to face us. You can face forward, which will, your voice will carry the mic. Okay. Thank you. I was the uh, lead Connecticut investigator sharing responsibility of the overall investigation with several colleagues uh, that the CDC assigned, one on site uh, and one in Atlanta. The investigation unit included staff from the CDC, Department of Public Health, several local health departments, and liaison staff from the FBI and USPS Connecticut. As co-lead investigator with the CDC team leaders, I directed the meetings of the investigation unit, provided support staff for the investigation, communicated important information to the Commissioner of Public Health and Governor. A little louder, please. Uh, uh, and met with uh, Connecticut-based uh, U.S. Postal Service officials at their request to interpret findings from the investigation and explain the rationale for public health uh, recommendations relating to them. In considering what we learned in Connecticut about sampling of postal facilities for contamination uh, with anthrax spores, it's important to know the context in which sampling was done and in which results were interpreted. We began our investigation only knowing that an elderly woman located far off the beaten track in Connecticut had developed anthrax more than a month after the last known intentionally contaminated letters had been mailed. Our main objective was to determine how she was exposed and to assure that anyone who might have been co-exposed was quickly identified and given an opportunity to take antibiotic pr preventive treatment. The Wallingford Postal Distribution Facility was only one of a number of sites where we investigated to determine whether anyone else had developed anthrax and where environmental sampling for anthrax spores took place. We quickly established several important points that turned our attention to the Wallingford Postal Facility. Our case had a very limited lifestyle that made it most likely she was exposed to anthrax in her home. She had not received any suspicious mail, such as that addressed to Senators Daschle and Leahy. Despite repeated and progressively more aggressive sampling, we could not find spores in her home. Her strain of anthrax, uh, however, was the same as that in the other bioterrorism-associated cases of anthrax. 
And finally, uh, although unrelated to her exposure, we found a letter in Connecticut that had been cross-contaminated with anthrax while passing through the Trenton, New Jersey Postal Distribution Center and which still had spores adhering to it when found in the home to which it was mailed. This confirmed that one could be exposed to cross-contaminated mail in the home. Thus, our leading hypothesis to explain all these findings became that she was exposed from a low dose of anthrax that was released into her breathing space from cross-contaminated mail when she opened it or disposed of it at home. To support this hypothesis, we needed to find evidence that cross-contaminated mail had passed through the Wallingford Postal Distribution Facility. Our efforts became increasingly more focused on mail sorting machines and on thoroughly sampling all 13 of them, not just the one that did the final sort of mail for her postal route. Uh, we had no other reason to continue testing. We had found no cases of anthrax in postal workers in Wallingford. None of the nasal swabs we took were positive from uh, 500 postal workers. And all of the 177 samples taken during three initial rounds of sampling had been negative. Uh, this is in stark contrast to Brentwood uh, and Trenton, New Jersey, uh, where uh, 40 to 50 percent of initial specimens were found to be positive. Ultimately, after taking an average of 10 samples from each of 13 mail sorting machines, we found spores on four of them. Further testing of these machines showed that one of them was heavily contaminated by two standards. First, nearly 70 percent of all samples taken from it were positive. None of the other contaminated machines had more than 6 percent of samples positive. Second, an estimated 3 million spores were found in one vacuum sample. No other positive sample had more than 370 spores in it. From, from an investigative perspective, these findings suggested that the Connecticut case of anthrax had been exposed via cross-contaminated mail, mail that had contaminated the heavily contaminated machine as it passed through it. From a risk perspective, we interpreted the positive findings uh, as described in detail in the written testimony. The real issue uh, is that one male sorting machine was still heavily contaminated with anthrax approximately six weeks after it was likely originally contaminated. But did this mean that there had been an ongoing risk of exposure to employees? Uh, we thought not. We knew that the risk of inhalation anthrax would have been greatest when spores initially entered the postal facility and when they might have been airborne uh, in the form of a plume. We also knew that no one had <coughs> developed anthrax despite a month passing from the time spores were introduced to when antibiotics were offered. In addition, there was no evidence that there had been widespread contamination based on the initial broad-based sampling efforts in the facility. Further, we knew that many other post, uh, postal facilities nationwide likely had a sim similar level of contamination. You hold us suspend just a second. Take your time. I'm going to ask you to just talk a little louder. The mics, uh, for some reason, are not as loud as they they've been in the past. So, it's it's yeah, it's it's pretty. Um, yeah, the black one is uh, C-SPAN, so that's not going to amplify. It's the <laughs> silver one. Yeah, does this, uh, yeah it it's is on, loud. but it's not loud. Okay. Well, uh, just to continue uh, further, we knew that many other postal facilities nationwide likely had a similar level of contamination that was unrecognized and, and that no one working in these other postal facilities had developed inhalation anthrax. From a theoretical perspective, no matter how many spores were found, as long as they were not airborne, they did not pose an immediate risk to anyone. Finally, the Wallingford facility had not used cleaning procedures that might aerosolize settled spores for more than a month. Thus, we felt that there was no added risk to workers from finding high quantitative levels of spores on one machine compared to finding any spores. Thus, the advice given to the U.S. Postal Service was that the only public health actions necessary to protect worker physical health were, first, to continue antibiotics on all workers for a full 60 days, with an emphasis on those who worked around the contaminated mail sorting machines. Second, to immediately stop using the machines that tested positive for anthrax and disinfect them. And three, to continue with cleaning methods elsewhere in the facility that would not aerosolize spores that might still be present but had not been picked up by sampling. Well, before uh, uh, completing my testimony, I'd like to go over what I think are the main lessons to be learned from our experience as they relate to sampling. Uh, there are four of them. First, it's possible to have substantial localized cross-contamination of a postal facility with no human cases of anthrax. 
the Wallingford Postal Facility was probably the most thoroughly studied postal distribution center where there were no human cases of anthrax. In the future, if something like this were to happen again, I think we need to ask ourselves, if there are no human cases occurring in the first one to two weeks after an attack, is it necessary, or at least how necessary, is it to be concerned about additional cases occurring without additional mailings? We can never fully guarantee that there are no anthrax spores present in a postal facility, so we also have to use our human observational information uh, in addition to the environmental sampling information to put things in perspective. Uh, second lesson, in any sampling initiative, the objectives of sampling need to be clear and the methods tied to them. If the objective of sampling is to find any spores, uh, if they're there, as it was in Wallingford, it's critical to use sensitive collection methods to sample where the spores are most likely to be and to take enough samples. On this note, uh, I think as others have noted, the initial methods used to sample postal distribution centers around the country were very insensitive with respect to finding any contamination. They were really only potentially useful to determine if a leaky letter packed with spores had gone through them. Third lesson, if we were to get another mailing like the one in 2001, we need to understand that the risk to postal workers will be highest initially and rapidly diminish even without preventive treatment with antibiotics. It also appears that the main threat once spores settle will be from re-aerosolization. Ideally, to prevent re-aerosolization, we need to continue to avoid using compressed air to blow out to blow dust out of machines, and we need to continue to avoid using vacuums that are not equipped with HEPA filters. Finally, uh, in my opinion, if we want to proactively monitor postal facilities for the introduction of anthrax-containing letters, we need to realistically define our objectives and methods. In my opinion, it may only be feasible to do crude monitoring of air around sorting machines to try to pick up letters like the Daschle and Leahy ones, actually not surface sampling, because we're interested in picking them up while there's still a risk, while the spores are in the air. Uh, with luck, we might find spores a day or two before the first postal worker develops anthrax if there are enough spores to, uh, uh, to potentially expose postal workers to anthrax. So th this, includes, this concludes my oral testimony. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, I am present. amazed that three of our witnesses have finished 10 minutes to the practically the second, <laughs> um, with very good testimony, I might add. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lane, you will finish up, and then we'll uh, we'll have you get our questions. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a shorter summary of my uh, written statement for you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm Davis Lane. I'm the deputy assistant secretary for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Can you lift that mic up a little higher? I'm I have sorry. A flat. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify about the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's role in dealing with anthrax at a United States postal uh, facilities and about the lessons learned from anthrax contamination uh, and about the detection and remediation <coughs> at the Wallingford, Connecticut postal facility. Also here today with me is Rich Fairfax, who is the director of OSHA's enforcement programs. Uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act requires that each employer furnish to each of his employees conditions of employment and a place of employment that are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. A 1998 revision to the OSHA Act expanded the definition of employer to include the United States Postal Service. Since 1998, the OSHA Act has applied to the United States Postal Service in the same manner as it does to any other employer. After post offices were uh, discovered to be contaminated by anthrax in the mail, OSHA worked with the post office's United Command Center throughout the anthrax crisis. We provided technical assistance with sampling and decontamination of the Brentwood facility in Washington, D.C., and another facility in Trenton, New Jersey. Because of this involvement, in April of 2002, the Postal Service asked OSHA to become involved in sampling and decontamination of the high bay areas of the Wallington, Wallingford uh, facility. 
At the uh, post office's request, OSHA provided uh, staff uh, and information to a U.S. Uh, post office contractor with technical advice on sampling for anthrax exposures in the High Bay areas. On May 29th of 2002, the American Postal Workers Union filed a formal complaint with OSHA's Bridgeport area office alleging that the Postal Service in Wallingford was not complying with the requirements of 29 CFR 1910.1020, which is access to employee exposure and medical records. And then on May the 31st, 2002, the union filed a second complaint against the Postal Service alleging that inadequate hazard assessment in violation of 29 CFR 1910.132, which is uh, personal protective equipment. Then on June 5, 2002, in response to these complaints, OSHA's Bridgeport Area Office initiated an inspection of the Wallingford facility. Following the inspection on October the 7th, 2002, OSHA sent a letter to the Postal Service. In that letter, it said, although a citation was not warranted, the Postal Service's failure to effectively communicate with its employees requires attention. OSHA typically sends this type of a letter when an inspection discloses safety or health deficiencies that uh, will not be cited. Subsequent to the events at Wallingford, OSHA has taken a number of actions to help protect uh, worker safety and health. OSHA participated in the development of the National Response Team's document, Technical Assistance for Anthrax Response, which provides the most current information available to the federal government and shares experiences in responding to intentional releases of anthrax spores in urban environments. Among other things, it addresses improved methodologies that OSHA adopted for anthrax detection before and after cleanup, as well as methodologies to minimize inconsistencies related to sampling methods, increase the ability to validate sample results, and conduct comparative analysis of area sampled. The use of these methodologies could eliminate some of the sampling problems experienced at Wallingford. In conclusion, we all know that this is a different time for our country, and we as an agency have learned a lot from the anthrax incidents at the postal facilities as well as from our participation in the events of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And we are working diligently to ensure that any future response is built on lessons that we have learned as well as the successes we have had. In this way, we can most effectively contribute our talents to the nation's emergency preparedness in response to catastrophic events. Worker safety and health is a critical component of <coughs> any response, recovery, and remediation operation. OSHA has demonstrated that we have the technical expertise and organization to ensure protection of workers. However, we are continually looking, wetters, looking for ways to better improve our performance. Uh, and I would be pleased to address any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Lane, and uh, uh, the chairman has uh, left the room for a short period of time. Um, I will uh, yield myself uh, 10 minutes for a round of questioning. And I'd like to start off with you, Mr. Day, if I could. I, uh, I wear trifocals, but my hindsight is 2020. I, I see well behind me. Um, given, given history, as you look back on it, would the Postal Service have notified the employees as to exactly what it is that they found, especially their representatives when they came forward and asked? I, I think with hindsight, absolutely. Um, I think, and you've heard it during the testimony today and some of the answers to your questions, there, there still is a bit of confusion and disagreement even about what 3.2 million colony forming units really means, particularly as you try to bring it to what does that mean for health risk. I think clearly that if communicating 3.2 million CFUs would have effectively um, given our employees more information that they needed, absolutely. We were trying to give them the best possible information. And, and, and I think the testimony I've heard, people talk about, well, 
it's eight to 10,000 is the threshold at which about it'll kill half the population, was the guesstimate, estimate from before. Then you find a machine that's got three million, three million spores on it. Uh, none of us know the number, but if the number wasn't significant, if there wasn't a reason for withholding it, it probably would have been disclosed. My guess is it was concern about panic and, and a lot of other concerns with the workers and the general public. But notwithstanding what the issue may have been, um, and, and if I can ask you, Mr. Lane, doesn't OSHA require specific information being given to employees once it's ascertained? I, I, isn't that what OSHA requires? Yes, uh, the OSHA standard uh, under medical access uh, to records 29 CFR 191020 requires that when an employee uh, requests the information concerning uh, medical monitoring data that it be provided to them within uh, 15 working days. All right, and because that wasn't done, and given, given the enormity of what was going on in the country, in my state, state government shut down. Every municipal government shut down. Nobody wanted to handle the mail. Uh, I live in a state that's slightly smaller than Great Britain, and people were flying samples in chartered airplanes of anything that was white or powdery that they received in the mail to the state laboratories. I mean, only God knows what the total amount of expense was to this nation uh, in terms of uh, the activity people took and, and the panic that took place. Why is it that OSHA chose to, make, to, to give a letter as opposed to cite the Postal Service? What is it that let them off the hook in this instance? Well, there are a number of factors. Uh, num number one, the uh, information provided to the employees uh, initially was the raw data that showed that uh, there I think was. It, I think it said trace amount, didn't it? Yes, uh, it showed uh, either a, it was in uh, positive or negatives, and then there, there was, a, uh, of all the samples, it would say tra trace amounts. There was, they, they, that information was provided to the employees on, on a, on a timely basis. Uh, the question then comes to the quantitative data. And uh, uh, as we looked at the information and conducted our investigation, there were a number of factors that uh, we took in consideration. There was a criminal uh, investigation that, that was uh, ongoing at the time. Uh, we had been in the facility early. Excuse me, is that the same standard you apply in the private sector? If there's a criminal investigation going on, then you kind of back off a little? Uh, it, it would be a factor that we would consider uh, in a, any of our investigations, uh, uh, whether it's with the, the, the post office or with uh, the pro another private sector uh, employer. What, what other reasons, sir? And, and, and uh, they got to three million, and I, given the fact that I, I, I've never heard before that three million was a trace amount of anthrax. I, this is the first time I've ever heard this quantified. Is that and I? I spent many years, you know, the last couple of years as a chief executive in my own state where we dealt with this in a lot of detail. And historically, we've dealt with anthrax. I've never heard three million spo spores ever defined as, as trace amount. Y yes, sir, go ahead. Dr. Hadley. Uh, it, <coughs> Hadley, yes, I'm sorry. If I can try to clarify at least uh, the initial use of the word trace, uh, the uh, important to point out that there was a time sequence to results coming back. Uh, the results from the November 28th testing, which is the first positive testing that also had the, the sample with the, uh, the uh, hundreds, uh, millions of spores, first just came back is that, that, uh, is a, through a phone call saying that we have a few samples of the 200 that were taken that are positive. And uh, we asked, can you tell us anything more about that? And they said, well, actually, there are about four samples. And one of them, uh, uh, or there are six samples uh, from four machines. One of them we're not 100% sure of. Anyway, but, they. But, but, Doctor, what I'm getting at is the. They told us it was only like one or two But after the first couple of months, the, the union was still asking. I mean, no. they were still asking for the, this. I mean, I'm not complaining about five, six weeks. It's a couple months later, and they still aren't given the information. Matter of fact, they weren't given the information until after they complained OSHA about it. Right, 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 in terms of the exact information. Anyway, I believe I, I, that complaint was filed in May, uh, the end of May, and then OSHA got on it about a week later. Right. Well, well, about four days after knowing that there were a few cultures that were positive uh, is when we uh, had done additional, sam additional sampling that showed that there were many cultures positive on the one machine plus the, uh, plus the one uh, con highly concentrated sample. And that, at that stage, there were a lot of discussions, but how, what the communication was with postal workers themselves is another question in terms of changing that from trace to heavy contamination. Uh, uh, Mr. Lane, another, 
a question I have for you, sir. Um, the, this was an emergent situation. We hadn't been through it before in this country. Given the fact now that we have that kind of emergent situation behind us, is OSHA in the process or will it revise its regulations to require the disclosure of this kind of information to workers or their representatives and the public in an emergent situation? Uh, yes, sir. We've received the uh, last month the recommendations from the from GAO, GAO. Uh, report. We're in the process of our uh, health professionals and standards uh, group look, looking at that. Also, we're awaiting uh, the uh, information from the national uh, response uh, team to look at that and see what's the best way uh, to proceed. Uh, also, uh, it's important that uh, we get information out. Uh, to the workers as soon as possible. So it may also be uh, uh, a good approach is to get some immediate guidance out uh, uh, to workers so that they can look at an OSHA website. We have a, a lot of information on our website dealing with anthrax on how to handle it, how to sample, it, what the sample results mean, and how uh, employers and employees can respond to, to that sample results. But we're, we're looking at the GAO re recommendations right now. Mr. Burris, if I can ask you, sir, is there, a, is there at this point a satisfaction among the group that you represent, the, in, the human beings that you represent, that the, the, the changes have taken place in terms of the procedure or proco protocols that would be followed in the future were this to happen again? No, no. Um, the employees uh, have the right to look to their government, their employer, and their union to respond to their safety needs. And the employer and their government failed miserably in this circumstance. You're talking about the future. Do you feel so? In the, no, absolutely not. Uh, the effort to install a detection equipment is going to be insufficient to protect the workers and the American public. Mr. Day, I'm concerned about something. You're talking about putting it in the top 100 facilities, this equipment in the top 100 facilities? No, sir. Was that uh, correct? The biodetection system, and actually, unfortunately, there have been several misstatements here today, misunderstandings about what that system is and Go how it works. Go ahead and explain it, would you, because it's important we yes. all know. Uh, there, there's two fundamental parts to the system. It uses continuous air sampling. It is placed at the very front end of our automated process where, on a daily basis, collection mail, and that is deemed as the high-risk, high-threat mail, we handle about 115 million pieces of collection mail. It's brought in from individual residences, businesses, and the blue collection box out on the corner. That was the source of the attack in 2001, and that is still deemed as, as high risk, or the highest of risk. So at the very first point in our automated system, we will do continuous air sampling. So to just correct some earlier misstatements, this is not about uh, an air sampling throughout the building. This is a very focused, targeted sampling technique on the front end of our automated process. A continuous air sample is gathered. It's then turned into a liquid sample and then utilizes a technology called polymerase chain reaction. It does DNA amplification. That means it can take very small quantities of a substance, amplify the DNA that's there, and then we do a specific gene sequencing unique to anthrax. Our test results have been exceptional, um, both as in use of surrogates in a live processing environment. I think as was explained earlier, you cannot test live anthrax in a live processing environment. One other brief question, my time yes. is up, but one brief question. The, does this, does this uh, bio uh, detection equipment have the ability to also look for other types of chemicals biological agents and toxins. What this is capable of doing is screening for multiple biological agents. It is using DNA. When you get into chemicals or even biotoxins that have been processed well enough that all DNA is removed, it is not capable of detecting that. That requires a different technology. However, the system has been designed in a way that as those technologies mature, they can be incorporated into the same system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Ms. Delora. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've got a bunch of questions, but, but, but I think it's important to 
just to cite something that Mr. Buris said, and I think my uh, colleague just mentioned this as well. OSHA knew, Postal Service knew, CDC knew, Connecticut Health Department knew. The only people who did not know were the workers at this facility. I, I think, in fact, that speaks volumes, and it's reason why one of the reasons why we're here today. But let me go back. Mr. Day, let me ask you several questions. What was the reasoning behind using a Postal Service contractor to conduct the initial tests on the Walling Wallingford facility rather than going to the experts at CDC? The, uh, the contractors we use, we use actually four of them nationwide as part of our nationwide environmental management program. Uh, we have four contractors who uh, were capable, remain capable of Credit, giving, cre Accredited yes. in terms of being able to deal with uh, uh, biological agents, et cetera, all the accreditation that's required. Yes. Okay. Do you think that this contributed to the delayed finding of the anthrax contamination in utilizing uh, who who recommends these? Well, they're, they're, they're attached to you. So it's just a question of internally within the U.S. P.S. that then the, the individual is um, assigned and that's approved and what, what's the process of... For the selection of these contractors? Well, no, not to go back to that, but, but, but new situation, anthrax, where is it going, what's it about? They had the accreditation, so you don't have to go to anybody else outside of USPS to, to, uh, uh, to be able to... Uh, uh, contract with any of these people. Well, we, no, we didn't need to go outside to contract. What we did do throughout this process was working closely with the, uh, the, uh, the other federal agencies, principally CDC, for their best advice. It was agreed that these contractors were capable, okay. and we used CDC-approved laboratories for the, the sampling results. So you, in conjunction with CDC, made a determination that these Postal Service contractors that you uh, had could do the job. Is that correct? I, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know the full extent of how that discussion went, but there was a general knowledge of here's the four contractors we're using, here's the sampling protocol we're going to use. Okay. The reason why I asked the question is because you, you, uh, they utilized for the first two tests, I guess on the 11th and the 21st, these the dr the dry swab uh, methodology. The first three. Thank you. The first three, dry swab methodology. Uh, Mr. Skolnick, I don't know if he's still here, but Mr. Skolnick said that. The, the, the literature back to 1917 indicated that this wasn't a terribly effective me methodology. But that I just wanted to get, but that's where these folks went. And I wanted to know how we got to these individuals. So the, it was a combination of yourself were, and, you, and, okay. and CDC. The contractors were doing the sampling protocols we specified for them to do. So if we had specified wet swab or wet wipe, they would have done that. Okay, um, so that that then the determination of how we proceeded was not their decision, but whose decision? Then dry swab, wet swab, uh, a HEPA. That was a that was a decision being made by the with postal, postal management, working with the advice of public health agencies. Okay. Um, and when it was advised to go to wet wipes and HEPA vax, that's what we moved to. Mm -hmm. Representative, uh, could yes, I I'm address sorry, some of that? As far as just for clarification, CDC really didn't have any buy-in on, on or other than a, a general opinion on contractors. We have no bias. We have no endorsements of other than being perhaps trained in, in, in industrial hygiene. We did recommend the analytical labs because it is part of the CDC um, with other agencies, Laboratory Response Network, who have, be, who have been appropriately trained and have the reagents to not only look for presumptive uh, positives but also confirm those samples. Mm -hmm. um, just for clarification. Uh, Captain Martinez, do, do, you, do your laboratories have the ability to validate the, the, the tests that were talking about here, that seems to be a, can you validate? Validation um, from, from our perspective is, is meeting or exceeding some type of measurement or sampling performance criteria. And it's, it's something that NIOSH actually does. My particular center 
on a regular basis for chemical agents. But these laboratories, we are working towards that. As was suggested in my briefing, we have a, a contract with, with Dugway Proving Ground who is actually looking to provide some information on limit of detection, on repeat, repeatability of these collection efficiencies and recovery efficiencies for analysis for both air and surface samples. As far as the laboratory response network, it's, it's important to note that early on in our investigation, the LRN was developed around an, a, a clinical model, meaning that these labs were designed because they are so intricately linked with the public health system to analyze clinical samples. It took time throughout this outbreak investigation to educate them about the new requirements for yeah, environmental sampling. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Captain Martinez, but do we have the capability at the CDC to validate these tests, should this happen again, do we now then have to go to another process of figuring out how we deal with, 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 with validation? I sit on Labor HHS, CDC comes before us all the time. Is this an appropriate question to ask them? Do we today have the ability to take what happened at the Wallingford facility with the tests, go to the laboratory and get this validated so that in fact there is no stumbling block in allowing people to understand and know what the heck their environment is all about. We have been doing that, both internally you, in CDC in our laboratories and also through the contracts we have with And Dugway. you did yes. not have that capability in 2001 when this occurred? Perhaps we had the capability, but at that time our laboratories and all others involved were inundated with responses to the anthrax investigations. So there's a difference between having the capability and being unable to implement the capability yes, for a variety of reasons. But you had the capability to validate. Yes, ma'am. So we could have validated if we had pursued this. Okay. Um, Mr. Day, what advice did you get from public health officials that led to the withholding of the information? My understanding, and, and I must say it was not directly uh, part of the conversation, there was a discussion about once we had the quantitative results, um, and that was not typical, that, and I was involved extensively throughout this, particularly with uh, the situation here in Washington as well as New Jersey. We were not getting quantitative results. We were getting qualitative results, positives, negatives. Mm -hmm. When we got positives, it was simply that, not a quantity associated with it. Mm -hmm. So this was somewhat unique, and in Connecticut, the local management team there from the Postal Service working with the Department of Public Health officials in Connecticut had a discussion about what is the best way to share the information. Clearly the Postal Service was responsible for taking the lead to announce it to the employees, but as I understand it, a determination rather than releasing quantitative results, it was put in a qualitative form beyond just positive and to clarify something, on December 2nd, the term trace amount was used. However, when the subsequent test came in, there was a clear change that was made even in the press releases that called it a concentration of spores. So the terminology changed, but the actual release of the quantified result was not given out. Um, I was not privy to the direct conversation, so why that nuance crept in, I'm not sure. Again, I think the earlier question in retrospect, in the future, we can share that quantitative data. And we should share that quantitative data. Well, I think that that's important to, to get on the record and, and in the prior panel that, in fact, the, the word trace amounts was misleading. And I, I, I don't, you know, what, want to take, take a look at whether the, the term concentrated um, amounts is equally as misleading as to... Um, you know, a, a, a full disclosure and the right to know uh, since the, a variety of other agencies uh, did know and there's a lot of, quite frankly, passing the buck and uh, covering, not, I don't say covering up because I, that's not, as, but, you know, just kind of dancing around this, this, this effort. I, I think as we move forward and understand the obligation to release the quantitative data, there also needs to be a collective agreement of how do you translate, translate a quantitative number, 3.2 million CFUs per gram, whatever the measure might be, into layman's terms. So if concentration of spores is not correct, it may very well not have been. 
we need to put it in terminology that people can understand and react to appropriately. Uh, people will react to, I've always found this, and I spend a lot of time with people on a regular basis, that if you're up front with them and you're straight with them, and to say, we've got a problem here, friends, we've got a problem, more than we anticipated, I uh, think we can deal with this, mm -hmm. but you are at risk. People are adults. You have to know what the nature of the problem is so that you can deal with it. Some of these people did not take Cipro because they felt it was trace amounts. So it, 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 it's simple terms. You don't need to give them all the scientific terms, but give them the knowledge that they need in order to make sure they can care for themselves and their families and make a decision about how they want to proceed with their public health. I would guarantee you that most of these people would have stayed on the job, too. If you told them that you could take care of it, they stayed there. They stayed there. No one else had to be there every single day. But they stayed there. Let me just, um, my time is up. We're going to have another. Um, let me just, um, um, I, I, too, have a difficulty with understanding, but I think we got to, to the conclusion on this with regard to OSHA. Um, the, the difference between December and the following September is unconscionable in terms of information being released uh, to, to, uh, to people. And why the, the Postal Service was not cited um, is a mystery uh, 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 to me. And I think that we have to take a look at what we are doing at OSHA um, if, uh, uh, if, this is, if, if we can continue with these pr procedures in another, in, a, in another sense. Um, let me just ask a question that has to do with the future, because we can go back to the past. I think failure to inform the workers of the uh, extent of this contamination, I, I think, really calls into question the uh, you know, faith that workers have in the management of the facility. What kinds of steps are, is the Postal Service taking to kind of rebuild that trust between workers um, and, um, uh, and management? And at the same time, what are you doing in terms of enacting these uh, recommendations that the GAO has, has outlined? Well, unfortunately, we've actually had a couple of opportunities to not just create the plan but to exercise it. In the case of Wallingford, we had the, uh, the high bay cleanup, the, the upper part of the building needed to be cleaned. Uh, the issue was raised uh, both by the district manager in Connecticut and the area vice president in Northeast area personally called me about it and were very concerned and we established protocols for that kind of cleanup and we did the testing. When we had the positives, that was clearly communicated as was the cleanup procedure and then ultimately retesting to make sure that it, it was adequate. Um, I was personally involved with a situation here in Washington on January 14th of this year where we had a false positive result over at the Federal Reserve. Um, we made an immediate decision to do a precautionary round of testing and closed the government mail facility here in Washington. Um, our district manager personally briefed the employees. Uh, we did the extensive testing. We let them know the results the next day. So we've not only created the plan, but unfortunately we've had to exercise the plan. I, I just want to say this to you, and then I'll give it to my, and I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, just this final comment. You know, during this period of time, I think it's fair to say, and uh, I, I was on the phone almost on a daily basis because there were so many conference calls that were going on, two or three conference calls a day. And I asked, I asked the Postal Service, I asked people to keep me informed of what was going on and what we can do. I suggested shutting the plant down. I suggested shutting the plant down. So what is, is irritating to me that I spent hours and hours on the telephone with government agencies, and I presumably have a responsibility as a member of this institution, as a, as a public servant, and someone gets elected to carry out responsibilities of full faith and credibility. And no time, no time was I informed of any of this. So that this was a, a, a shell game of the agencies who knew what was going on, talking around it, and every, every single conversation that I had didn't, I wasn't in the loop on this effort as well, as well as the workers. Had I known there, you would have had a demand to shut this plant down. 
while we were doing what we needed to do and to be prudent and to use the language of the report, aggressive in how to handle this issue. And so I feel personally violated in that sense that I was misinformed of what was going on in that facility. And I think I want to be very clear about that and put that on the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It is on the record. And I, I also want to say that I think the um, employees were extraordinarily tolerant. In the, and the sad part of this story is that um, there isn't going to be the same trust next time because you did have a lot of different people know about the contamination. And instead of voluntarily giving it to the employees, when they requested the information, it was denied them. Um, so it would, you know, at the very, you would think that when you know this, you would say it. And then you have an honest dialogue, um, Mr. Ha Dr. Hadler, that we don't quite know what this really means yet. That's fair. But Mr. Burris's fellow members are entitled to this information. But the, well, I think what's, what, what is shocking is that when the request was made for the information, it wasn't forthcoming. And, um, I'm, t I'm still trying to sort this out. I'm going to give this back to Mr. Janklow to, to ask some questions, and then uh, I'll have some. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Hadler, when, when I read your testimony, sir, I, 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 I get the feeling that the, there was no one person in charge of this investigation, if I can call it that. It was a committee uh, put together from, if I recall, CDC, uh, DPH, which I assume is Department of Public Health, um, local health departments, the liaison with the FBI in New York, and liaison from the Postal Service in uh, Connecticut, yourself and your offices. It, it, are those the folks, was it being kind of run by a committee? Yeah, it, it, was, it was kind of run by a committee where everybody's ideas were heard and discussed. Uh, the reality is there were probably sort of two points of leadership, but it really was kind of a matrix. And the two points of leadership were the Department of Public Health, and that was me and the committees, although reporting all the time, I mean, many times a day to the Commissioner of Public Health and as needed, the governor uh, knew about things and got involved. And then the CDC uh, staff, one of whom from the CDC Command Center in Atlanta was listening in on all of our daily uh, meetings and participating as well as as well as the close to 25 CDC staff who were present helping us with but the investigation. But that's a committee. But it, but it is a committee. I mean, it, it is a committee, but we all shared ideas and came to consensus on, uh, in, in, a, on what to do and passed information up and down to our respective bosses who could certainly overrule us on anything that we in, uh, were doing. In, in hindsight, would it, would, if this were to happen again, God willing it doesn't, but let's just say if, if it were to happen again, would you have somebody that oversaw the whole thing, a person that oversaw it all, a top manager, if I could call it that? Uh, Potentially, I, I mean, it's clear that you need somebody to make a final decision. You know, if you if you need a tiebreaker, uh, I think in general. Uh, with the people involved, we didn't need that. I mean, we were able to come to consensus. We were able to discuss information. We were able to uh, successfully communicate it up and down our chain so that we didn't did you, constantly get over. For example, did you, did you all agree, the whole committee agree, that you would call it a trace amount? Was that a committee decision? You know, that particular one wasn't a committee uh, uh, a committee decision. I think I think that particular term came out when we were explaining the first positive findings, discussing them with the postal leadership, uh, and our interpretation of them. And we got questions about well, how much was really found, and then we described sort of trace and why we thought I, that. I, I assume and that it wasn't that, just the workers, it. doctor, the media, the public. Uh, elected officials were all asking the committee, how much is there? H how much is it? A am I correct in my assumption? No, no, it, it, it was a, in terms of that, how much was it uh, came out, uh, uh, well, it, it came out in our discussions, but then it came out again as we were meeting with postal officials uh, outside the regular committee meeting to further discuss the findings and, and, and what they meant so that they could be clear on what they meant. I, I, I think the term trace, unfortunately, uh, crept in uh, uh, early on, uh, uh, in part because we were asked, well, sort of how much, okay. and we said trace in the sense of very low percentage okay. positive and 
and only a few colonies on each of the couple, specimens we were aware more, of. A couple yeah. more questions, Doctor. As I read your testimony, on the 21st of November, mm -hmm. um, there, uh, let me back up. On the 11th of November, there was a, um, a sweep done, let me call it that, uh, of the facility, an analysis done in the facility, testing done in the facility. Right, right. right. It, 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 that was part of the U.S. Postal Service o uh, Only testing. one yeah. mail sorting machine was examined. On the 21st of November, there was another uh, sweep done. I use the term sweep uh, analysis done, testing done in the facility. There were only six samples taken from mail handling machines. On November 25th, there was another uh, examination done of the facility and there were only eight samples taken from sorting machines. And then on the, um, so what I'm wondering is, why weren't all the sorting, why didn't the committee think that it was important to look at mail sorting machines? Is there a way for mail to get through those facilities without going through a sorting machine? Uh, sure, it's a, uh, an excellent question. I think the initial, well, the initial uh, two samplings were planned by the Postal Service, and they were broad sweeps uh, because a broad sweep potentially would have picked up uh, uh, if a Dashiell or Leahy type letter had gone through. At that stage, we didn't know if we were dealing with a, a new mailing or we were dealing with possible the residual of an old mailing. Uh, then, then uh, as those results came back negative, the next round of sampling on the 25th, which used wet, wet wipes and was planned, the first one really planned by our team uh, directly, uh, it was decided to sample all kinds of machines in there, including uh, uh, taking a few samples from the, mail from the machine that sorted mail for her postal route. Uh, then after that, a little more discussion said, you know, uh, came to the conclusion that uh, if this mail came in from outside, uh, it really should have, uh, who knows what machine it could have come in on. As Dr. Martinez uh, uh, pointed out, uh, we also decided that uh, in reviewing what mail was in her trash, 80% of her mail was bulk mail. One of the machines, which hadn't been sampled at all before, uh, handled predominantly bulk mail. So it was decided then to just go for all the mail sorting machines in detail. And that's do, when we first- Do you first know how many mail sorting machines there were there, sir? Yeah, th th there were 13 uh, uh, high-speed mail sorting machines. Uh, and uh, on this sampling, the first time we actually went for From all your of testimony, sir, it doesn't appear the 13 were ever all tested. No, no, they, they were first tested on the 28th. That was the uh, first time four of them were found to have positives. And then we went back to those four. Actually, actually, three of them were found to have positives, and one of them had a false positive initially that turned out to be negative. But we went back. As soon as we found that, we took the machines offline and then uh, thoroughly resampled them to try to get a better idea as to how contaminated they were. And that's where we came up with uh, close to 70% of the samples taken from the one machine were, were positive. Heavily, were and, were and heavily contaminated. Right. And, and, and I'm, I'm not playing with words, sir, but this is all important. You can tell by the animosities and anguish that people have. You call it a heavily contaminated machine. Is that a fair phrase that could have been given to the public? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. And the, 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 the other thing I'd like to ask you about is, um, it says, and, and your page seven of your testimony and your conclusions, the previous conclusions about risk to workers are unchanged by these findings. Could the gentleman suspend a second? I'm, I'm just uh, wrestling with a number of things, but your question surprises me. Um, from your testimony, it was a heavily contaminated machine. So walk me through your mindset, your mind, as to uh, what that said to you uh, and what it said should have happened. Okay, there's, uh, I mean, two... Uh, the machine is heavily contaminated. Right, right, right. Two interpretations, or, or there's two aspects of the interpretation. Number one is, uh, 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 what does this mean with respect to how, our, how one person in Connecticut got anthrax? And from our perspective, it meant that, that uh, this particular machine, one that sorted mostly bulk mail that was dumped, right. uh, uh, it, it looks like this could be the source of, of okay, the mail so that, one thing it tells you. that exposed her. But then from the public health perspective, uh, you have to sort of step back and look at the whole context. This machine was presumably contaminated since sometime in mid-October. 
Uh, we didn't know that there was anthrax in Connecticut uh, and had no reason, obviously, to investigate anything until uh, late November. Uh, the, more than a month had passed. Not a single person had gotten anthrax. If, if this heavily contaminated machine uh, hadn't produced any anthrax in a month, based on all, everything we knew about anthrax and incubation periods, it was highly likely to, unlikely to produce any anthrax. That the spores walk me were... Through, walk me through yeah. that, though, because the anthrax spores, um, uh, they don't lose their potency so quickly. So what, what makes you comfortable in saying that? I mean, they could be in, in 100 different places just, you know, Sure. At the right time for someone to stir up the dust and inhale it. So, sure. No, no, no that's a, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, they, they don't lose their potency uh, right. uh, particularly, and if, and if aerosolized, they could they they could pose a threat. Okay. So the, uh, having they, said that, so so recognizing that they hadn't been successfully aerosolized to the extent of exposing anybody in the preceding month or so, and and ordinarily we would expect people to get sick within a week. Of, right. of being exposed, as did the people in Brentwood, as did the people in Trenton. Uh, uh, that, uh, so it, it, that was one piece of information. Another was we hadn't found spores in our widespread sweeps, uh, meaning, uh, which is unlike Brentwood and, uh, uh, and Trenton, where they found spores widely throughout the facility, even with dry, even with, uh, actually I think it was mostly wet swabs that were used, but, uh, uh, it, but they found them very, very readily. Uh, and they also found them readily with dry swabs in Brentwood. Uh, the, uh, uh, that it didn't look like there, there wasn't evidence that there had been widespread aerosolization, that these spores were, had gotten onto the machine, that they weren't ones that were, they were sort of heavy spores, if you want to call so it that. So you're saying if they, they were, were on the machine as heavy, you just assume they stay heavy? Well, well uh, if this had been the first day before we, if we had had no context to put this in, there had been no other anthrax cases, we would look at it very differently than knowing when contaminated mail had gone through and known that we had actually been yeah. living with this situation for more than a month, yet no one had gotten anthrax. Okay. We also knew, and I, I don't know if this, how much of this has actually been published, we knew that New Jersey had found at least 10 different, had, had found uh, uh, no, at least five different contaminated postal facilities using only 20 cultures scattered around the postal facilities in the greater Washington, D.C. area. At least 20 post offices had tested positive for anthrax. Yet there were no, yeah. yet there were no what, cases. What I'm hearing you say, no basically. No cases anywhere in the country. And what so, I'm, what yeah. I'm hearing you saying is that this was a heavily contaminated machine. The machine was heavily contaminated. And you basically made a decision or, or reasoned that so much time had passed that if the damage wasn't done already, you didn't need to fear any damage in the future. I'm having a hard time sorting that one out. Yeah, well, because the, uh, you, yeah. You're, you, we, we know that the spores can be dormant and they can be in certain places and they could be stirred up and, you know, so, anyway, I, do, I, yeah. I thank the, the gentleman for you. The, uh, the, 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 just the one thing about the stirring up or aerosolization of spores, uh, again, if this, had, if this had been happening over the last month, we should have seen anybody, people with, I mean, over the preceding month, we should have seen people with anthrax at any time. We'd also done nasal swabs on all the workers uh, who had been started on antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, nasal swabs, uh, if you've been heavily exposed to anthrax in the last few days, should uh, uh, then, uh, for to the inhalational form, uh, then potentially some of those should have been positive. None of those were positive. Uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, you know, all of this went into our thinking. The other thing was is that the postal facilities for more than a month had stopped using compressed air to blow out machines, which is really where okay. I would have been very worried yeah. about these yeah, spores. Yeah, I was just out. wondering about yeah. the people that might have gotten bulk mail in their homes. But, but notwithstanding however you sorted this out, there is a total agreement in this room, I believe, that uh, the public has a right to know exactly what you found, and then you can give them your arguments as to why you don't think they need to be concerned. Sure. Is there any doubt in your mind that that's got to be the practice? No, no, uh, no absolutely. I mean, that, that has to be the practice. When, uh, I mean, this information was explained, and our, interpret our public health information was explained. It was ultimately up to the postal uh, uh, service because per their own agreement. No, to let me just say that's where we to really explain part, it to the workers. No, we part company there. I, it seems to me you're the public health official, 
and it would seem to me that your job is to make sure they do it, and if they don't, you do it. I mean, and I'd love to, when I have my questions, yeah. sort that one out with you. Now, Thank well, you. I, I'm sorry that I took so long in inter intervening here. I, I just have a couple. I would agree with your last statement, though. I mean, <coughs> I, I, mean I, I think uh, in retrospect, you know, if we have to do this again, you know, that we'll be sure that we're more directly involved yeah. in the communication of the workers yeah. so that there isn't any either. I think everyone needs to look Mr. Burroughs in the face and so tell that, him that directly. So, so, so that no assumptions are made about how things are yeah. communicated yeah. and if they're being communicated. Yeah. We all need to look yeah. at him in the face and tell him that. <laughs> Mr. Janklo, I'm sorry. D Dr. Hadler. The fact of the matter is there are times when individuals don't want public health issues disclosed, but you have a responsibility to do it anyhow. Isn't that correct? The classic example would be communicable diseases. You, you, you notify people that have been exposed or potentially exposed, and you try and run them down. Sure. Um, no, no, no I, uh, I agree. If I could be very brief with a couple questions. Anthrax spores can live decades. Isn't that correct? Uh, matter of fact, they live in the ground, especially out in, uh, they live in the soils uh, in this country. A am I correct? Uh, that's right. And it isn't just a matter of uh, where you said in your testimony, sir, the previous conclusions about risk to workers are unchanged by these findings. The real risk was when the spores were introduced and possibly airborne in the vicinity immediately around the machine, not now. The cutaneous um, contraction of anthrax comes from contact with the spore and not necessarily airborne, correct? Uh, th that's right. And so to the extent a postal worker has any kind of cut or um, uh, opening in the skin, uh, to the extent they touch that envelope that has anthrax on it, there's a potential that they could get continuous exposure. Uh, th that's right, right. And, and my statement uh, referred just to inhalation anthrax, but you're, okay. you're, you're correct. And, and the lady, the 94-year-old lady that died, do we know that it was an, 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 uh, inhalation anthrax that she died from? Uh, y y yes, we do. In addition to that's, that's sort of the way she presented clinically, uh, an autopsy was done looking for other possible routes of exposure to see if she actually had, might have had a skin lesion before anything else or any gastrointestinal uh, ingestion of spores, and there was no evidence that that happened. It all looked like it came straight and, from her and, lungs. And recognizing that several of the witnesses here today have talked about the fact that uh, if, it, if, it's door if it's lying on a surface, as long as you don't maybe spray it with an air gun um, or disturb it that way, that uh, uh, it may just, it's, it kind of adheres to the surface. Has anybody ever speculated how this 94-year-old lady had a letter and ingested airborne anthrax? Uh, yes. Uh, she do blow it open? The well, well, well no, it, what we think is, as I had mentioned uh, in my oral testimony, we did find a letter in the house of, uh, of someone else, uh, uh, not that far from her, uh, but on a slightly different postal route that had come through the Trenton, New Jersey within 15 seconds after the uh, Dashiell letter went through, or either the Dashiell or the Leahy letter. Uh, uh, we, had, we found that letter. We went to the house. We could repeatedly isolate spores from the outside of that letter, not from the inside of the letter, and not from any of the mail that it was stored with. Uh, what we speculate is that she got some bulk mail that was similarly contaminated like that. She had a, she tore all her bulk mail in half like this before throwing it in her trash. Uh, and we speculate that in tearing it in half, your leverage is much better around your mouth, that some spores were released, she inhaled them. And in her case, she was one of, as you've heard before, she was one of the vulnerable people who, uh, uh, for whom uh, many fewer spores were uh, sufficient to cause anthrax. Well, one, one last question. D D Dr. Martinez, in light of the experience that we've all gathered from the past, from the incidents involving the Postal Service and, uh, and the Senate buildings, and South Carolina, I believe it was, where they had the incident down there, has CDC changed its protocols in terms of what local public health, local officials, local businesses, local anybody should be doing when they, when they come across positive tests. One, the way you test, let's start there. One, the way you test, and two, the methodology um, by which you inform the public. I can, I can address your issues as far as the env environmental and analytical. I'm going to defer the, the public health coordination liaison to, to Dr. Perkins. But yes, since um, everything we've learned, not only from research, but also our outbreak 
responses. We have since posted guidance on the CDC website that actually lists out strategies on how we think one should approach first responders and public health officials for investigating anthrax, how you would sample for it, how you would interpret that. These are the methods that we seem that we think are appropriate and we are, those are the methods that we are working on validating in-house as we speak. Also, we are working with our, through CDC, through the Laboratory Response Network to send out protocols so that we have a certain consistency with methods, analytical methods, amongst our public health labs that are out there, and these are state, city public health laboratories. And the current uh, CDC recommendations for handling of facilities if an environmental positive is found continue to suggest, as they have since November 9th, that that alone is not an indication to close a facility and that there needs to be additional consideration uh, of the entire context of the situation, such as Dr. Hadler has, has pointed out. I think two points are important to, to, to recognize. First, surface sampling provides a very incomplete picture of human health risk, and that there are two critical components that that in no way measures. One is the potential for that for that particle to get up off the ground and get inhaled to the lung. And so the aerosol capability of that particle. And two, a very critical uh, characteristic is the particle size. So if that three million um, uh, colony forming units is, can't get up off the ground and is not in the, the 0.5 to 5 micron particle size, it does not represent a, a human health risk for, for inhalational anthrax. How large were these in the Postal Service building? Do you know? We don't have technology or methods to measure, and that is a major limitation in building that bridge from surface sample results to human health risk. Sir, I, I don't quite understand you. You say that it's got to be smaller than five microns. Yes. Yet we don't have a way to measure it. Oh, we do have way in the laboratory, and in fact, uh, everyone's been referring to referring to uh, animal experiments indicating a certain range as as uh, infectious. Those are done in very careful laboratory settings where the particles that go into the animal are actually measured as they go into the animal. The other thing is that we know of environments, including your state, where there's extensive environmental contamination. And there's people working in those environments that are at no risk for cutaneous or inhalational disease. And in fact, the bacillus anthracis that's present in those environments has to be amplified in a animal infection to present a risk. So we know of other environments in the United States where people are working uh, you know, for the last 25 years in contaminated environments that do not represent public health risk. So, you know, we, we are working from a basis of experience in making some of the kind of recommendations that Dr. Hadler referred to. Thank you very much. But those are nature grade and not uh, weapons grade anthrax. That's, that's clear, but uh, again, weapons grade anthrax pertains primarily to the aerosol plume at the point of release, and these particles quickly become very sticky with electrostatic charges and attach to things and form particles that then do not present um, a health risk. Thank you, Mr. What's Chairman. That? Thank you very much. Uh, let me just quickly go through some questions. Uh, as I can ask a short question, the answer may be longer, but I'm not looking for long answers. Uh, Mr. Burris, are workers still concerned about their health and safety at the work sites? Yes, yes, there is still a concern. Um, and the concern is not the, the residue of the anthrax attack certainly is lingering in the minds of employees. But I think the, the overall concern of the employees and their union is that, as reflective in much of the testimony today, it is that we did not suffer any illnesses. We suffered no deaths beyond Brentwood. That is to put posted employees in the category of being guinea pigs. Being that, what? Guinea pigs. Yes, that we sir. don't know. We have a serious problem until somebody dies. The postal officials and the employees at Brentwood were told the same thing. As you know, the, the Leahy and the Dash letters occurred before Brentwood. Capitol Hill was closed. They were testing dogs. Brentwood remained open. 
All of the excuses that have been presented here today were given to the employees at Brentwood and Hamilton Township. So far, it's not weapons grade, it's dormant. If it exists, uh, you're safe. We had the two deaths. The deaths generated the closing of Brentwood and then partial closing of Hamilton Township. Subsequently, we, we had the problem in Wallingford. We went over the entire process all over again. Nobody's dead yet. Let's wait and see. The same information was given to the employees in Wallingford that was given to the employees in Brentwood, that it's safe, you can work, we'll contain it. And uh, it has not been contained. And I suspect that if it occurs again, I don't think the le lesson has been learned. Uh, I don't think the message is clear that the health of the workers is paramount. And this adoption of the word trace amount to cover a multitude of sins, to give a misleading information to the employees, I think is wrong. And I think the employees legitimately continually have a concern for their safety and health and the protection they receive by those institutions that have the responsibility providing them protection. Okay, uh, I you. think the legitimate concern of the employees I represent. Well, and it's it very, will be. very understandable that your employees would feel exactly the way you've described it, based on what we've known before and based on this hearing. Uh, Mr. Day, are you completely confident that all USPS sorting facilities are free of anthrax? Well, I, I can state categorically I know they're not. I mean, we have the Trenton facility that is not yet cleaned. Um, On what basis can you make that statement? We, we know that Trenton is contaminated and we have not yet decontaminated. So I, I know that. How do you know the other facilities are not contaminated? Well, that, that's the other part of the question I didn't answer, which is to the extent other facilities may be contaminated. Uh, we did the extensive testing up front. There is the recommendation from the GAO that the Postal Service work with these myriad of agencies to reassess risk and determine whether additional testing would be required. Um, we're very open to that idea. We fully embrace it. Uh, we'll determine what the risks are, where we potentially would need to go back and retest. Yeah, let, me, let me ask you, how many of the faci USPS facilities were actually sampled for anthrax? 211. Out of how many? We have uh, about 380 processing centers of various types. And, and the then 211 were all processing agencies? No, some of those were actually uh, targeted locations in the areas directly impacted in Washington, New Jersey, and New York as well as Florida. How many of the uh, 211 were processing? Uh, just over 100. So out of the, uh, you did 100 out of the, how many processing? There's roughly 380 that do some level of processing activity. And so the balance, 111 were postal offices? Yes. And how many postal offices do you have? 38,000. Okay. Um, how many of these uh, facilities that were tested used exclusively the dry swab method? On the first round of testing, it was all dry swab. So are all the facilities that you did, the 211, did you uh, only go first round or did you do a second round not using the dry swab? Uh, on our first round of testing, we found 19 with the dry swab that had some level of contamination. That's really not what I'm asking. Okay. I'm asking how many of these facilities were uh, done with a wet swab? Of the 211? Yeah. They all, all were dry swab. They were all done during the uh, October 23rd so, so through November 18th. So how many 18. were done with wet swab? Uh, the five additional ones that had uh, more extensive contamination. So if you didn't get contamination with a dry swab, then you didn't do the wet swab? Correct. And we've had testimony that basically says the dry swab is kind of useless. There's been discussions about going back and was there a need to go back and do additional testing? And the advice was no. Uh, again, given the GAO recommendation, we'll go back and look at that again. Uh, yeah, um, Ms. Delora is, is rightfully asking. I'm, I might get a Baptist church here. I love it. <laughs> the, um, but her, her question is very important. By whom? Who, who advised you? Uh, there, there was a discussion with our safety and health staff with the same collection of agencies. So it's the postal people advising the postal people? 
No, no, we sought outside help from... Uh, no, let, from let's pin this down. Who, who told you that you do not need to do wet swap? Uh, I, let me not speak out of school because I was not privy to the conversation, so I can get you specifically who was involved in the conversation. We had a safety and health manager that was dealing with uh, other agencies, so let me what, get what you the specifics. What leaves me uncomfortable, I've been doing a lot of listening. I haven't done a lot of questions because I've been trying to sort this out. And, and the one thing that we in this committee try to make a practice of is not, you know, after the fact say, you know, it's your fault um, because hindsight sometimes is very important. And I also try to put myself into the <coughs> position of the time in which there was lots of pressures and lack of knowledge and so on. But Mr. Burris has been about as a, a gentlemanly as you can be. And he's having to listen to this, representing his workers. And um, we, we have, I mean, the testimony was pretty clear. The dry swab is pretty useless. So you, you have given me the impression that you really shouldn't have given me, that we've tested 211 facilities. Because actually, we've done it with the dry swab, and that's kind of useless. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you kind of put yourself there. Because really what you should have said up front disclosure in the spirit that we would want in the future is, you, you know, uh, we need to say that we've done 211, but frankly, those were done with dry swab, and we only did about five with a wet swab, and, and you know, we may need to re-examine how we go forward. Now, your response may be, you know, haven't seen any, any deaths or injuries, which is kind of like Mr., you know, you're just kind of adding to Mr. Burris comments of the guinea pig. Um, you know, no one, no one died, so we must be all right, even though we didn't really test these facilities. Do you disagree with my uh, conclusion that, uh, based on the testimony we've had, that uh, doing the dry swab is going to meet the need? From what I've heard today and the assessment of the dry swab, no, I can't disagree with you. We, we do need to go back at it. Okay. I don't know what back at it means, but we'll... Well, uh, Congressman, it, it basically, we, we don't have microbiologists on the staff. We, we truly have sought out the best advice we can. If the advice of these agencies is that we need to go back and do wet swab, wet wipe testing, aggressive air sampling with HEPA uh, to assure that the original 211 are truly clean as we first thought they were, then that's something we'll do. Let me ask you, in the, in the five facilities where you, you, uh, you utilize the wet swab method, how many uh, of those five facilities were found to have anthrax? Those, the additional testing was done in facilities where there was some preliminary positive that indicated we needed to do additional so, so testing. So when you think about it, <laughs> this is like really almost humorous. In, in the five facilities that you did it, you actually found that you had a problem and you had anthrax in those five facilities. And the dry swabs found it, but the wet swabs... Uh, we found it on multiple sampling types. So we found it on dry swabs, wet swabs, right. HEPAVAX. Right. It was multiple sampling protocol. We also had 19 facilities with only dry swabs that were also found to be positive. Our early round of testing. Wait, wait, wait! Don't, don't. What, what happened then? Did you go with a wet swab in those places? No, we just did a pure dry swab, and found out where it was, and did a decontamination effort, and then subsequent testing. And you did the decontamination over the whole building? No, it was very isolated. We found very isolated results in certain buildings where it was very specific, and we were able to just get it decontaminated See, what with surface. Just, what you've just told me, though, is that there are. 19 facilities where the dry swab found anthrax, but the wet swab would give you a better reading, and you didn't do that. That's correct at that time, yeah, yes. Well, that's, that's a little cause for concern here. Um, hmm. What factors did you consider in deciding that retesting facilities would not be necessary? Cost, practicality, legal issues, political issues? I would Question. definitely rule out cost, political, and legal. Um, the only thing we've ever used in this process is advice from experts on what's necessary for the safety of employees. 
So there's a risk assessment that's done, and I think you've heard that from some of the other witnesses. And we followed, <clears throat> excuse me, followed the advice uh, that they've given to us. Who is they? Again, um, it's been state public health officials where appropriate and CDC. In my office, if uh, everyone is in charge, no one's in charge. So I always, I always assign someone to be in charge. And it's probably the, one of the best lessons I learned early on. Because early on, we would discover something we needed to do, and then it didn't get done. And I realized everyone thought someone else was. I mean, we have this case where CDC, the state officials, UPS, um, and it's like, you know, I want to know who ultimately is held accountable for this. And in the answers that you give me, um, when I don't, I'm not comfortable, and I think you're not comfortable with the decision, it's we were advised. Um, they. Uh, we sought out the best help we could. Um, so I, I just will tell you, I, I think this hearing is almost ripe for our committee to come up with some real quick conclusions and as to you know who should be in charge of of deciding protocol and practice and so on who should be and decide who should make sure information is communicated um, i um, I really think that the postal uh, postal department basically made a decision that the employees and the public couldn't handle the data, and you weren't quite sure what the data was. So you decided not only not to voluntarily provide it, but you resisted providing it when it was requested. I'm talking about the Postal Service. I'm uncomfortable that the state uh, was kind of deferring to Postal to decide uh, what should be disclosed and not disclosed, because I, I really believe that this was a public health issue. And Captain Martinez, uh, I want to get your reaction to what I've asked and what the questions, uh, response to questions. Could you, could you repeat the question, please? My mind went blank yeah. first, and I apologize. No, you don't need to apologize. Uh, I want to know what you have thought about the responses of Mr. Day, of Mr. Hadler, the responses that were early uh, in our first panel. Uh, I, want to, I want you to help me sort out what CDC's role is. Um, you know, there were people that knew that, our, that there was contamination at the site at CDC, uh, and uh, they didn't feel obligated to speak out, which is kind of amazing to me. Um, so, you know, tell me how, how you sort all this out. The CDC, when we respond to an investigation, we respond, as, as suggested earlier in my presentation, uh, at the invitation of the state and local governments. We come to assist. Uh, we don't try to direct. It's, it's not within our mission. We try to provide expertise, um, uh, whether that be sampling, analytical, epidemiological. And we try to work with them to provide the best advice that could guide um, their response with as much information as they can. Um, from the very beginning, I was deployed with <coughs> Dr. Perkins to Florida, and we started delving into that realm of environmental sampling, which up to that point had not been done for a biological agent, a beat bioterrorist agent. And it was at that point in time that I contacted resources that I have through my experiences through mold sampling and my biological expertise that we knew at that point in time that, that wet swabs were the way to go, but were not perhaps the best way, and we started Say, wet swabs were the better than dry swabs. Right. You have pretty sound reason to make that dis conclusion. It was, it was based on a scientific paper and research that right. had been done out okay. of UNLV for DOD. So if you see dry swabs used, you what? You're like a machine, you don't respond to it? Or we know. We, we tried to re-educate where we, where we could. And even in Florida, we were already using HEPA filter vacuums and wet wipes at that point in time. That message had then since been linked out to our other response teams on Capitol Hill, Brentwood, Hamilton, and as you can see, a certain amount of consistency. Even on Capitol Hill, we hit the ground with wet wipes and vacuums, and also the same was true of Brentwood as well. Is your ultimate authority HHS? Yes, sir. Okay. The, um you were aware, uh, were, were you not aware of the challenge up in Connecticut where there was uh, contamination? 
but not yet made public. Were you aware of that? To, to be honest, sir, I, no, I was not. I was privy to some of the conversations and the conference calls um, because I was the liaison, if you will, with our contract laboratory. So I was aware of the data that was coming through. So the answer would be yes, through the conference calls you were aware. Aware that the information existed, yes. That, that there was contamination? Yes. Yeah. So was there in these conference calls a dialogue about maybe the public had a right to know and the employees certainly? I don't recall. Again, I was not privy to all of the two-a-day conference calls that were there. I don't know if Dr. Perkins has a better perspective from the, the CDC more yeah, Dr. Uh, public Perkins. health response. Yes, well, I, speaking from my many colleagues at CDC, right. I feel confident that if, if there were scientists involved that recognized a clear increased risk to human health as a result of this particular finding and informing the employees of that finding was, was a high public health priority, um, I, I would hope that those involved would have, would have um, conveyed that. I think the uncertainty here and, and where things went gray and it looks like where things went wrong with a, with a loss of trust was the, was the the importance of this to human health risk. Right. Now, I mean, let me caveat that with saying that clearly I think disclosure with caveats is, is the way to go. And I think many people at, at CDC uh, would, would agree, everybody would agree with that at, at CDC. Let me just ask this last question and I'll ha recognize Ms. DeLora. Um, what legal obligation and then what moral obligation would someone at CDC have to make sure this is disclosed to the public? Uh, if in fact um, it was determined that uh, employees or the public were, um, could potentially contract anthrax uh, due to a contamination, what kind of obligation exists? In other words, is it just do you advise or if, if others who have this information don't speak out, uh, is it the moral and, or legal obligation or both for CDC to speak out? I, I cannot comment on the legal obligation, but I can comment very clearly on the moral obligation in that all of us um, in public health seek to do anything we can to protect, protect populations, especially like those served by Mr. Burroughs. Right. Um, and that is, in, I mean, that's why we are at CDC. And I know that, that Dr. Hadler feels the same way. That's why we are in public health. So I would answer your question that we feel the absolute strongest moral obligation. I don't know what the legal obligation is. Uh, Captain Martinez, what I would like is I'd like a list of the people who were on those conference calls. Um, and, and it, it is not, you know, to, uh, I, I guess what I'm not totally, con and I thank you, Dr. Perkins, for your answer, because that's kind of what I would have hoped it would have been. Um, but it is, I'm not convinced that we have a clear sense of obligations as to who would make sure this information is provided and who will be the backup if someone who's responsible doesn't do what their obligation is. Um, and I would just be interested to know who I'd like this committee to know, and we could contact those individuals, as to what was being dialogued here and, and why did the system break down that employees weren't informed? You know, and then that also leads to the fact that then once the employees request the information, why they still had trouble getting it. I mean, it's bizarre. I think it's important to recognize as well, and this is was suggested by Dr. Hadler, that there was, there was much involved in the, the decisions were, that were made in that point, and that had to do with before the quantitation results, if, if I remember correctly, were even out, that particular machinery was isolated with polyethylene and, and contained at that point in time. I, th I think that's all important, but, but, it's, but there were people who worked with this machine, and these are people who might have been exposed. And they had, and see, even though you want me to know that, it makes me feel uneasy because it seems like the counter. And there's no counter to the fact that the employees needed to be 
informed. Yes, sir, and I, I wholeheartedly agree that the employee should have been informed of all the information, and I think CDC supports that as well. Um, and with the exception of that quantitative result, and we said in our, our briefing is that would that have made a difference in the recommendations that were made to those employees? No. Whether it was qualitative or quantitative, um, we still would have recommended that the equipment be isolated, that it be remediated, the prophylaxis was, was recommended to be continued. Those, those public health recommendations would not have changed. Yeah, but if you had been one of those employees, you would be absolutely outraged that you were not notified. I agree with that, sir. And that says a lot. Uh, just as a, a, a follow-on to the, the phone calls, I truly would like to know who was on the phone call when the decision was made not to provide the workers the information. There are lots that has to do with the health, uh, uh, you know, considerations, what the scientific uh, uh, discoveries were, but who made that decision? Was um, uh, uh, the Postal Service on the phone? Was CDC on the phone? Was OSHA on the phone? Was the Connecticut Department of Health on the phone? Who was on the phone that made the conclusion that says when the requests came for the data that the decision was we are not going to provide the data and not going to provide the data. If there's an answer now, that's fine. And if there isn't, I'd like to know who was there to do that. Further, if you look at page 16 and page 17 of the GAO report, uh, when we did find the, um, uh, the um, uh, heavy contamination, um, that, and it goes back and forth here, although we were told that no documentation uh, exists about the advice the Postal Service received at the time, according to district postal managers, the chief epidemiologist informed them that there was no additional risk to employees for the same reasons previously cited. And you've all have talked about these areas in which you would not have said that. And that CDC concurred. CDC concurred with that assessment in terms about the risk. The other piece is what I asked uh, Captain Martinez a, a, a bit ago is that one of the reasons for the lack of disclosure of the information uh, to the workers is that we could not validate. Now, the fact of the matter is that we could have validated but we had a backlog, if it was over, at least in, in terms of that, so that we waited several months until September to get information to people, and we would not disclose any information to them, and we said we couldn't validate it when, in fact, we had the facility to validate this and to do it, to say this takes precedence. We have a problem here. You may not be able to do it in the run of the course and do every building, every facility, but you had a specific problem in Wallingford. So you clear the decks and you validate so that, in fact, you may be able to provide the relevant information to the people who work there, especially after having been asked on several occasions so that we really shut the door amongst the various agencies that were engaged here of taking a course of least resistance. That's not appropriate. And I think I, 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 we understand that. And I honestly do believe that you understand that now. But we can't afford to put people at risk in this way. We're charged with a responsibility. Each of the agencies were charged with a responsibility you know, to, to do when it's in the public's interest. And I venture to say that the public's interest and the workers' interest were not not served, but poorly served. And as I made in my comment, my opening re remarks, we lucked out, and you know Mr. Buris is right, it's not understandable. It's not understandable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to close up here. Um, does Mr. Uh, Governor Janglow, do you have any comment you want to make before? Sure, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Sure. I'm, I'm going to be brief. I, as I listen to the testimony today, and I really appreciate one, you, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate you calling for this hearing and all of the witnesses that you and your staff selected to bring forth. It's been a good discussion. I think some things are pretty clear. And as I said before, I wear trifocals, but my hindsight's 2020. You know, we, we in America talked a lot about being prepared before a lot of these things happened. But it was really talk in a lot of respects. We have unusual problems in this country because we have thousands of governmental jurisdictions. 
we have 18,000 law enforcement jurisdictions. Between city health departments, county health departments, state health departments, the federal government, you know, only the Lord knows how many there really are. This to me isn't done like what's happened in China recently. They had a problem with SARS. They didn't really want to tell everybody too much about it because they didn't want to panic everybody. They thought they could keep working and moving forward, though, in trying to deal with it. When I was younger in life, they, when somebody was terminally ill, the doctor told everybody but the terminally ill person. <laughs> they used to explain to them that, you know, grandma's not going to make it. But they never told grandma. Yet grandma's the one that needed to know because she had decisions to make. You know, as we look back, the, the, this is a first-time event for all of us. And, and as the chairman said, I'm not interested at all in assessing blame as much as I am. What have we learned from it? You know, as Cicero once said, to, to be ignorant of the past is to remain a child. And I believe it was Santayana that said that a nation that doesn't know history is fated to repeat it. We know history. And so we shouldn't be fated to repeat it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one, we, we need to figure out, as one of the witnesses said, who's in charge at the national level and at the local level. This can't be run by committee, by consensus, and by majority vote. There has to be someone that makes the decisions very rapidly every step of the way. We don't have a lot of time. This isn't like making decisions as to your future in college as to what course you ought to take next semester. These are the decisions that you make on an hourly basis and an instantaneous basis. In addition to that, I think OSHA's learned from this. Um, were it to be done again, they'd probably treat the Postal Service like they would any other private business. Probably been a lot harder on them, and should have been. Uh, I think CDC has learned a lot from this. The reality of the situation is, and you, Captain Martinez, say it so well, that you work with the local and, and, and the state governments, and it's always been CDC's role to try and not push the envelope, but to respond to requests from locals. But in the world of terrorism, where folks are out there deliberately trying to hurt other people, it's different than the way God used to kind of spread diseases and sicknesses around. And so you may have to end up being far more proactive and authoritarian, if I can use that word, than, than historically you've been, even at the risk of sometimes alienating all these quasi-sovereigns uh, that are out there in what we call the United States of America. And, and, and we really have too many, you know, too many cooks in the soup and nobody in charge. And so this has been terribly enlightening for, for, for this particular congressman, only because um, all of us together, I think by discussing it, I think the end result is the Postal Service, if and when it were to happen again, will be far more proactive. They will be, their, their workers will be involved on the front page instantaneously, that, that arm in arm, as the testimony indicated, you all like to do it, is the way it will be done in the future. Center for Disease Control will be far more upfront, and, and clearly is today, um, and, uh, and the state health departments will be far more proactive. The net result is, is that I think that our people are better protected, but they're not yet protected. And so I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for these, these hearings, and uh, to the extent that uh, the one thing I didn't ask and that I usually ask witnesses is, if, is there something that any member of the committee thinks that uh, uh, we as a Congress can do to help facilitate an improvement in the process? And so I just ask that any committee member that has any insight, if they send mean any, it, any of the people here? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> yes, any of the witnesses, if any they the would witnesses. send that to us, I would uh, certainly appreciate it. But thank you for this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank all of you for your straightforwardness and candor. I thank uh, the, the uh, witnesses as well in both our panels. Very helpful. Um, obviously, I thank my colleagues on the uh, dais here who asked excellent questions uh, as I listened to their questions and to the responses. Is there anything uh, that any of the witnesses want to put on the record before we adjourn? Is there anything that you might have thought about last night that you knew needed to be part of the record? Any, any comments here? Uh, if that's the, the case, let me, before adjourning, uh, before uh, ending uh, this hearing, uh, thank uh, Joseph M McGowan, who was uh, 
uh, a detailee uh, to the subcommittee from the Department of Labor's Office of Inspector General. We appreciate his work uh, in this effort and obviously the work of the committee on both the majority and minority side. And uh, I thank all of you for your service to your country and to your community. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll learn from these experiences and do a better job. Uh, and with that, uh, this hearing is closed. Next on C-SPAN 2, a discussion on relations between the U.S. and Syria, then a hearing on next year's spending for the Agriculture Department. Later, remarks from Poland's president. Poland is getting ready to